It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We are tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. We've got a jam-packed show for you today, this Friday. One big theme that we'll dive into today, labor market limbo. This year, major companies have seen a wave of layoffs sweep the U.S. Amazon, City, and Macy's, just to name a few. And the latest to join the growing list of job cuts, Wayfair. The furniture retailer now slashing 13% of its global workforce to help trim costs. We'll break down what this means for the overall health of the labor market, the Fed policy read-through, and equity market reaction this morning. Let's get a check of the futures 30 minutes ahead of the bell this morning. You're taking a look at green across the screen, the trifecta, the hat trick, whatever you want to call it, call it up for the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. All right, but first, let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Jared Blickery, and Josh Lipton have more. Hey, Shauna, tech stocks fueling the AI rally this morning. Meta ramping up its AI push through NVIDIA's popular computer chips and Apple's Vision Pro headset now available for pre-order today. We'll discuss whether or not that rally has more room to run. And uh, retailers, they're joining tech firms in the latest wave of layoff. Wayfair looks to trim costs by slashing roughly 13% of its global workforce. And Macy's, for its part, plans to cut more than 3% of its headcount, in addition to closing five of its retail stores. And it looks like the problems are far from over for regional banks. Several of the nation's best-known mid-sized lenders reported sizable drops in profits during the fourth quarter, a reminder of how challenging 2023 really was. We're going to break down what the uncertainty of regional banks means for consumers' wallets. Our top story of the day, futures racing higher this morning as tech stocks breathe life back into the sluggish market. Meta and NVIDIA, two leaders in 2023's Magnificent Seven rally, helping bring stocks out of their slump as Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says the company's, quote, future roadmap for AI includes 350,000 of NVIDIA's H100 graphics cards. This follows more great chip industry news from Taiwan Semiconductor as well as a bullish call on Apple stock. All of this news pushing the Nasdaq 100 to close at an all-time high on Thursday, according to Bank of America. Close to that all-time high there here. We're continuing to track that. Top gainers from last year. Once again, top pick for most investors. We have Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer with us to break down more. Josh, what, I mean, what more do we need to say? <laughs> AI. AI. Well, I think we could say AI and hang up the phone, right? We're back. We're That's back. What to, seemed like a Davos. Everyone yeah. was talking yeah. about AI. We're back to that moment, right? Yeah. We're, we we spent two months talking about regional banks and you know, kind of talking about some different trades and getting people excited about other things that don't have to do with tech. And then, if you really look at the market action over the first three weeks, you could just own the Mag Magnificent Seven and go home, because the Magnificent Seven is what is driving this market again. When you look at performance, when you look at it compared to the S and P 500, like we're showing on your screen now, outperforming the S and P 500 in the month when we're talking about just January, and then you see the Russell 2000 really coming back to earth in the month after that big rally we've had. The Russell 2000, of course, a pretty regional bank heavy index. Interesting to just kind of see this trade, guys but also important, I think, for the market, right? When we talk about how big tech is overall weighting in the S&P 500 and being able to bring us higher. Yeah, and Josh, as you were reporting in your conversation uh, with Keith Lerner over at Truist, you were saying it really just comes down to math, right? Given the fact, the size mm -hmm. and how much of uh, the magnificent uh, seven accounts for the S&P and really the broader market here. My question, though, to you is in terms of the strategists and what you're hearing, what you're seeing in these notes, how much of this market momentum that we've seen at least over the last 48 hours, this renewed excitement around tech, how much is riding on these earnings results here that we're gonna be getting in the coming weeks? Oh, a lot, right? And I think it's important to remember, like, yes, you have the headset out from Apple today. You have Mark Zuckerberg going on Instagram and talking about what they're doing with Meta and AI, but you also had strong earnings from Taiwan Semiconductor, yeah. and you had them talking about AI growth of 20%. And I think it's important to remember that's part of really what I think when we saw futures tick off, before Thursday's trading session, that was where the movement started to come and you're gonna see that really matter in earnings. And the other thing too, guys, that I think is important to remember here when we're talking about owning these companies, everyone's at a little bit of a different stage in their AI story. 
And that's going to be something I think to focus on over the next two weeks, right? When we're talking about Microsoft, when we're talking about Google or Alphabet, right. that's a different AI story than Meta. And it's a different AI story than Apple, who pretty much just pulled that lever this week and hadn't really mentioned it before, right? So I think it's important to remember what the investor expectations are for AI before the company that you own reports earnings. Right, because there's so many different, there's three kind of core buckets that you can think about that mm -hmm. generative AI as the latest form and iteration of JI, AI innovation that a lot of these companies are gonna have to think about applications or the models or the chips, and we've already seen the chips play yeah. out as well. And for investors, it's not just enough just to mention AI. We talked about the fact that it was mentioned so many times in earnings calls, but really starting to, and it has, I think you can make the case last quarter too, uh, really turning into a show me story, just in terms of what exactly this means to their bottom lines. All right, Josh, thanks so much. Let's get to a trending ticker here this morning, part of a larger story that we're tracking on Yahoo Finance, and that's Wayfair joining a chorus of companies announcing layoffs in the last couple of weeks. Now, the e-commerce giant this morning cutting, saying that it's going to cut 1,600 jobs, around 13% of its workforce. Share, shares are jumping ahead of the open. You're looking at gains of nearly 14%. Now, Wayfair joining the likes of Macy's, Google, City, even Amazon. You had Macy's announcing job cuts and store closures on Thursday. Google CEO Sundar Pichai said, a memo to employees warning of more job cuts amid their investments and their uh, allocation to AI. And then Citi also announcing plans to slash about 20,000 jobs. They made that announcement as part of their earnings report here that we got last Friday. And Brad, this all goes back to the theme that we have been talking about when it comes to cost discipline. Right. So many of these companies are making these types of strategic decisions, trying to best set up their company for what can be and what looks like is going to be a very uncertain couple of months, couple of quarters here ahead when we look ahead to what exactly we could hear from the Fed in terms of Fed cuts, the uncertainty and kind of the cloud of, I guess, keeping many of these companies on the sidelines in terms of their spending plans or reallocating some of their spending plans because of this. And unfortunately, not necessarily uh, something that we haven't seen in prior years, but we are seeing companies make adjustments on headcount. They're looking to lower their costs. And unfortunately, many jobs are being slashed as a result. Yeah, spot on. I mean, if we're trying to prepare as well investors for any of these additional announcements to come forward, there's one core thing that you can look to to see exactly what type of impact or immediate reaction is going to translate through to the equity market action, and especially for these individual names here. And it's how much they're going to incur in some of those costs up front. That's something that is actually a dollar figure that analysts, investors can start to price into exactly what these levels of layoffs mean for weight to fare in particular, as that was the most recent one in workforce reduction that we had seen come forward this morning. Approximately $70 million to $80 million of costs, primarily employee severance benefits costs there. But then, as you were mentioning, it's a larger read through as well to what the Fed may do and what the Fed senses about the employment situation more broadly. And if there are more severe cracks that if we see more announcements like this could start to show up because they've been able to hang their hats so much on the employment situation in order to combat inflation to this point. Yeah, certainly. And that's going to be something the Fed is going to be closely watching here. But then when you pair that, though, so the recent data that we've gotten out in terms of the jobs report for December, yep. much stronger than what the street was anticipating. Yep. The claims number that we got out this week showing a drop in claims pointing to a stronger, more resilient labor market. So there are signs, I think, from both sides of the spectrum. So that's where the uncertainty lies. Let's talk a little bit more about that because warnings of job cuts here from Wayfair City, Macy's and Google renewing that focus on the labor market. Could this be the start of a larger trend? Now, we know the jobs data is closely watched by the Fed. With the latest print showing that the labor market has remained resilient, yet it has cooled from those highs that we have seen over the last 12 months. So what does this tell us about the timing of Fed cuts? We want to bring in Michael Gaffin. He is Bank of America's chief U.S. economist. Michael, it's great to talk to you again. So let's start with the Fed cuts, the timing, and exactly how the labor market, the recent developments that we've seen that, how you see that playing into the decision here that we could be getting from the central bank uh, over the coming months. I guess, do you think a March rate cut is still on the table? We do. We, we have four cuts this year, so 100 basis points in cuts in 2024, but the cutting cycle starting in, in March. And I think you bring up a good point that the labor market is more important in the Fed's thinking than it was, say, 12 to 18 months ago when the Fed was willing to endure, in, in their words, some pain in the labor market in order to help bring inflation down to low and stable levels. But as we moved across 2023 and into 2024, the, the Fed is seeing actual data that says, hey, we can grow at a modest 
rate uh, while still seeing inflation come down. So in December, the Fed admitted their reaction function has changed a bit, meaning the more the labor market softens, the more the Fed will be inclined to move to rate cuts and potentially move faster. So yes, the the more the the, the quicker the labor market cools down, the more Fed cuts should be coming. Is it is it more about seeing that unemployment rate? tick higher to that above 4% and, and actually 5% uh, forecast that some economists had put out there? Or is it on the other side, if the Fed is able to still have a strong employment situation, but see inflation continue to cool and get to that two handle but 2% target that they put forward, that it's fine if the labor market doesn't deteriorate to the expectation that some economists have put out there? That's right. I, I would say the latter, the latter, um, composition of your remarks there would be consistent with, you know, the soft landing outlook. Um, in, in other words, the, the I, I think the Fed has a, a stronger vested interest in achieving that soft landing than at any point during the recovery. So as long, you know, the supply side of the economy has rebounded, global supply chains have eased, but more importantly, all the discussion we had, you know, 18 months ago about labor shortages has has gone away. The participation rate has rebounded strongly. It's allowed the services side of the economy to expand as rapidly as it has, while still bringing down wage pressures. So I think the Fed's of the mind and saying we don't need to step on the labor market too hard, and they would want to lean against any expectation that the unemployment rate needs to rise to five percent or above. Some backup, I think, is is warranted, and they would be okay with it, but. Um, something in the low fours is probably what they're thinking. So anything beyond that, again, would lead them in the direction of rate cuts to underpin activity and prevent the labor market from weakening more. Michael, if we don't see the Fed cut rates in March, I know you are expecting that, but if we don't see the Fed I'll follow through and do that, what does that then do for your prediction or your expectation of a recession? How much does that raise the odds that we could see some sort of hard landing for the economy? Well, I think if, if they don't go in, in I think they're close I think it'll be close enough in March such that even if they don't go, I think all of us would say feels like conditions will be right for them to start the rate cut cycle around the middle of the year. So I think more likely people like us in the March camp would say, OK, they're close, just not there. They need a little more evidence. So let's let's think June. So I doubt a two to three months difference in the timing of a uh, easing cycle and normalization cycle would make that much of a difference. But the longer you know, the, the Fed would delay, the more I, I would get concerned because markets have priced in a lot of easing. So if the Fed doesn't validate some of that, financial con conditions could tighten. And then perhaps you would risk a, a sharper slowdown in the labor market. We were reminded, we were reminded last week, Michael, that as a courtesy, usually uh, more broadly, the Fed in the past has not been in a, a massive kind of cutting cycle going into election in order to seem or at least appear apolitical. But if this is an economy that calls for multiple rate cuts ahead of that, then how for the Fed do they continue to need to make sure that they're kind of towing the line and, and not seeming overly political? Yeah, I think in the in in the recession scenario, it's obvious, right? No policymaker wants to be in that world, but what you should do is is obvious, right? So if there is, for example, a sharp drop off in employment and we get a negative employment number, it's obvious what the Fed should do and the data would support them cutting, uh, even if that happened in September, for example. So the, the weaker the data is, the more obvious it is how they should respond and that would take kind of election concerns uh, on, on the sidelines. It, it is a little trickier if the Fed's cutting on inflation alone while the economy still looks good and strong overall. But I think if they start, again, if they're able to start the rate cut cycle in the first half of the year, it gives them time, I think, to explain what they're doing and communicate why they're doing it. And, and it should lessen some of those kind of election related distortions or, or risks for them. So um, I, I think it's something that that can be managed. But yes, it'll take some adept communication on their part. And Michael, we got to go. Just remind us, how many cuts are you pricing in or, or anticipating this year? We have a 425 basis point cut, so quarterly pace of cuts for 100 basis points for the year. Michael, always a pleasure to get some of your insights. Thanks so much for kicking off uh, ahead of the trading session, kicking off the 9 a.m. hour with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly.
Well, more regional bank results are out this morning, showing problems may continue into 2024. This earnings season has been a mixed bag for mid-sized lenders, with several, including Discover and Key Corp, taking significant profit hits in the quarter. You're taking a look at some of the activity um, and extended hours activity that we're seeing for Key Corp and Discover, even though Discover took a hit yesterday, so just a bit of a reprieve um, off of that decline that we had seen come forward on the back of some of their earnings results. Yeah, exactly. And Brad, when we take a look at the results that were out this morning, if we pull up fifth third here, because that is on the move following the results that we got out here, net interest income coming in at $1.42 billion. That was slightly below what the street's expectations were, average deposits of $169.5 billion. So again, pointing to an improvement when you compare it to prior quarters, but when you do it on a year-over-year -year basis, pretty consistent with the theme, Brad, that you were just talking about, this drop that we've seen on a year-over-year -year basis. So yes, I think it's safe to say that the regional banks are on solid footing. They are starting to regain some of their momentum, but it is too early to say that they are out of the woods just yet. When you take into account some of the other themes that we see a play out from some of these regionals, going back to profit specifically, and we were just so showing Discover Financial there, taking a massive hit yesterday, one of the worst performers in the S&P, and that moved to the downside coming after its earnings fell 62% from a year ago, similar story over at Key Corp with their profit falling 36%. So this also goes back to the conversation that we were just having with Michael Gapin in terms of Fed cuts, exactly, rate cuts, excuse me, from the Fed, what exactly the timing looks like for that, because we know that is pivotal and critical here in terms of the performance that we could see. Obviously, if the Fed does cut rates here, that would be a bullish sign for some of these regionals. I think another bullish sign and, and a key point in this, which really was one of the core elements that we had seen in the regional banking crisis, especially last year, was a hint on sentiment and pressure on deposits. Now, what they are seeing is an alleviation on pressure of deposit costs. So uh, that beginning to rebound, expenses remaining controlled, they're saying, and credit costs are as expected at this point in time, uh, at least for citizens camp. But that is something that is continued to be watched by investors as of right now is just what the deposit profile looks like among customers, because there's a direct pass through to what the sentiment and comfort comfort with continuing to put your deposits in regional banks, especially when we don't know if, as you were saying, if they're out of the woods yet, if we are done with seeing consolidation for some of the key um, regional banks at this point, too. Yeah, certainly. So some names to keep on your radar here as we head into the rest of the earnings season. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance because coming up, we have much more from Yahoo Finance's morning brief. We are going to break down the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance, a big focus on iRobot. Some news coming from overseas. We're seeing a massive reaction in that stock this morning. Also, the implications, what that means for Amazon. we got those details for you when we come back.
A trending ticker we're watching this morning, iRobot plunging after the EU reportedly intends to block Amazon's $1.4 billion bid to buy the company, according to the Wall Street Journal. The rejection would still need formal approval before a final decision. There you're taking a look pre-market at shares of iRobot down 31% as of right now. The larger question is, was, will, was Amazon and are they going to be willing to go back and try to put forward these concessions? They already missed the deadline. Unclear as to whether or not there will be some leeway here with the EU regulators there. Yeah, there's lots of questions there. And obviously, we're seeing the reaction play out in shares this morning. I, ro I robot one of the top trending tickers, uh, tickers on our Yahoo Finance site. But moving this forward beyond the EU, of course, then the focus comes to the FTC. The focus comes to yep. U.S. regulators. There are reports here that it is expected that U.S. regulators are going to push back against this deal, citing antitrust concerns. They are preparing uh, Amazon for a legal challenge here in the EU. They did decline in terms of making any sort of concession that the EU had been pushing for and the EU regulators have been pushing for Amazon uh, to pledge fair treatment to all robot vacuums that were offered on their platform. So pushing back on that, they're now preparing for a legal challenge. But again, this then, when we look ahead, we turn our focus to the U.S., to regulation here. We know, obviously, there has been a crackdown under the Biden administration pushing back on some of these types of deals in terms of antitrust concerns, in terms of some, this monopoly concern, whether or not there's going to be fair competition throughout this space. So once you see some of the pressure from overseas, from EU antitrust regulators planning to reject this $1.4 billion bid for iRobot, then you have to think to yourself, there's a good chance that maybe U.S. regulators are going to take a similar view. Oh, yeah. And the EU has been more stringent yeah. on Amazon. I mean, do you think back to some of the other settlements that Amazon and the EU have had to reach in the past over anti-competitive practices? Uh, this is just another kind of uh, point in the chronological order that we've seen for the EU Amazon tussle. It is. We will see once we get that official decision again. Just a report here from the Journal. All right. Well, Spirit Airlines flying high today after raising its fourth quarter forecast. Now, the budget airline now expects revenue $1.3 billion coming in at the top end of its previous forecast. This coming after a judge blocked JetBlue's bid to buy Spirit earlier this week. When we take a look at a one-week chart of Spirit, you can see the stock has actually fallen about 60% since we did get that ruling there on Tuesday. You can see the reaction that we saw at the open on Wednesday as well. And then we've continued this downward trend today. We're regaining some of that, I guess you could say, in terms of some of the movement there. But again, in terms of what this means for investors, this is a bit of a relief because there's there was a lot of worry about Spirit's ability to survive after the court, uh, after the judge blocked this deal. So in this regulatory filing, Spirit saying, quote, it continues to believe that a combination with JetBlue is the best opportunity to increase much needed competition and choice. So backing the thought that they do think that the deal obviously should go through with JetBlue, you got to, though, question what exactly this means beyond even Spirit and JetBlue bringing Frontier back into the conversation and also just the competitive landscape within some of these U.S. airlines as some of these smaller players are trying to compete with the big four domestic Look, carriers. Uh, this is a ultra low cost carrier that perhaps has one of the lowest net promoter scores, at least as last I've checked, of airline operators right now. It's also a company that if you look in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, their logo just might be next to nickel and dime. At the end of the day, for the consumer experience and going through this next period of travel where they're looking for more premium opportunities, as we've heard from some of the CEOs that are continuing to have those different bookings come through among both corporate and leisure or leisure travelers right now, that push towards premium, it's a larger question of where there might be added opportunity for the ultra low cost carriers to still service people who just need to go somewhere but for a super low fee here. Just to put a fine point on this and one number, one of the things that they're looking forward over, over for over the course of this, uh, the company is looking for reporting a top completion factor of 99.7% during the holiday period. They just did. And then additionally, um, they had about $1.3 billion of liquidity that mentioned. So it's a question of how they put that cash and liquidity to work for this company, too. Certainly. All right, well, let's get to another uh, trending ticker here this morning. The stock to watch today, and that is super microcomputer shares climbing up about 11 percent. This coming after the company boosting its sales and earnings guidance for the second quarter. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with more. Maddie. 
So SMCI, the latest name to watch if you are looking at what is fueling this AI rally. This is a super computer company. It's going to be driven up by hyperscaler allocation. So what does that mean? Basically, the Microsofts, the Apples of the world, they have these huge data centers where they stole all of our, all of our data here uh, that we have on our phones, right? And that is really hard to keep up with because as we do with our phones, the storage starts to run out. So those big tech companies have to look elsewhere for storage and SMCI is one of those places where they start to look. So again, this is one of those names that's going to benefit from the overall push into AI and that benefit, I can't stress enough what a huge surprise this was to my sources this morning. Their revenue projections are up over 100%. They expect $3.6 billion in revenue this coming year. Their last forward guidance said that was just going to be $2.7 billion. This stock is already up 20% year to date. And as you mentioned, it's up 11% in the pre-market this morning. So again, this is just the latest name that's going to be fueling that AI and tech rally. And it's important for our investors to look at this name because it's not going to have the extreme multiple expansion and high valuation that makes some of those go-to household magnificent seven names a little too expensive for investors to break into. So that's why this is a stock to watch. Having said that, some analysts say that some of the AMD names that are more associated with uh, the Asian market might be a better play. But for those who don't want to get in to stocks that are more tied specifically to what's going on in China, this is a stock for people to get interested in. All right, certainly is. All right, Massa Mills, we'll check in with you in just a few minutes. Coming up, we got much more from Yahoo Finance's morning brief. The opening bell on the other side of the break and taking a look at futures here before we go to break again. Nasdaq futures pointing to gains at the open, carrying through on some of them uh, yesterday is momentum. Much more for you when we come back.
And there's the opening bells on Wall Street as we cap off the final trading day of the week. Lots of excitement. Some confetti, actual confetti, real confetti returning real confetti on a to Friday. the NASDAQ today on Friday, Ooh. adding some excitement down there. We've got team coverage for you. The biggest market movers following the opening bell. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Jared Blickery standing right beside us here at the Interactive. Maddie, let's start with you just in terms of some of the excitement that we're feeling on the floor here this morning. Well, the S&P 500 is inching towards its record highs. I haven't been this excited since the end of 2023 when I was anxiously awaiting that record-breaking high at 4796.55. That is the number that we are waiting to hear from the S&P to hit its record today. We'll see if we get there, guys. But the Nasdaq already beating the S&P to the punch yesterday with a record-breaking high on the close. That was, of course, driven by uh, the chips rally that we saw after those record-breaking TSMC earnings with that forward guidance of an upside of 20% to their revenue guidance. That is what drove the trade yesterday. And we could continue to see that today when we're getting some other good news from other players in the chip space. Again, that NASDAQ hitting its record-breaking highs. And we'll see if the S&P is able to eke out an 11th week of gains in the last 12. Also, again, I just want to mention possibility of a rate cut in the swaps market. That's down to about 50%. And the yield curve continues to disinvert in the uh, tens and thirties space. We're still waiting to see what it does in the twos, tens space. But that would allow us to say what recession. So we're looking forward to that here too. All right, we've been saying that for a while. What recession, Maddie? Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Jared Blickery on the home base here at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Jared, what are you seeing? Uh, no recession on the screen here just yet. <laughs> we see the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ all in green territory. Just want to check on the NASDAQ for the week, and let's get uh, four days into this holiday shortened week. You can see up not quite 1% there. Uh, lots of record highs, as Maddie was talking about, and we've been talking about NASDAQ 100 and the Qs. They hit a record high yesterday. I want to focus on the S&P 500 first over the last three years. You're going to see, and let me put a line chart on so we can see these lines a little bit better, but Basically, we have round-tripped the entire bear market and are, are just within a hair of closing within that record high territory there. Now, if you take a look at the S&P 500 equal weight index, it's a little bit of a different story. This kind of uh, tracks a little bit the Russell 2000 chart, which is a small cap chart, but nevertheless, you can see we broke out of this, uh, this resistance and now we've come back down. Are we going to test? Are we going to have liftoff? remains to be seen here. But one of the themes, themes that I've been tracking here is the rise in bond yields and the strong dollar this year. We'll have to see if that continues. For today, though, we're tracking uh, tech and financials. Those are in the lead up almost 50% apiece. Communication services also up one third of a percent. What's in the red here? Materials, staples, utilities. So it looks a little bit defensive on the downside and bullish on the, on the upside. So the conclusion is we're looking at a bullish day so far. Pretty early, though. All right, Jared, we will keep an eye on that again. Some green on the screen, which is certainly welcomed here from investors. All right, well, let's get to our market commentary of the day and switching from a U.S. equity focus and taking a look at some of those names overseas or tied to overseas, I should say. Alliance Bernstein is zeroing in on some Chinese stocks with what they say is big upside potential. So among those names, Samsung, BYD, Pinduoduo are, uh, are the stocks to watch this year. Now, among the most promising, and I want to talk about BYD because this is a name that we have been focusing on now for some time. We talk about the fact that it did overtake Tesla in terms of the top EV seller. But what was very interesting in this note here from Alliance Bernstein was specifically what they said about growth potential with BYD because contrasting that to what we're seeing play out in the U.S. And they're pointing to the fact that, hey, they do see a lot of demand on the horizon. The potential here for BYD to expand what they say into the underpenetrated mass and premium segments in China and, put, and putting that in perspective, it accounts for about 20% of China's auto market. Right now, only 9% EV penetration. So they see a huge upside potential in terms of BYD's role in getting more people on board with the EV, uh, EVs here in the years ahead. And then also what they are seeing in Pin Duo Duo. And that was a bit surprising given the data that we got out this week, pointing to the fact that the Chinese economy continues to struggle, 
Pinduoduo, Duo, more of a, con a consumer facing name you would think would be under pressure given the fact that recovery is taking a bit longer, but maybe more of a fundamental story, valuation story with this name here. Yeah, on Pinduoduo, Duo, they had said that it continues to gain share within the domestic e-commerce market. And then, as you mentioned, BYD. Look, the company's coming off of some key announcements there, both the autonomous vehicle and the AI vehicle that they had started to tout a little bit. Also, you've got the first EU EV factory that the company is bringing online in Hungary. So those positive movers. But I do want to focus quickly on in SK Hynix. Not a company that we talk about all the time, but this is one that Alliance Bernstein thinks has about 64.8% upside, round figures, 65%. They said it's showing stronger performances near term, mainly thanks to its lead in HBM, that's high bandwidth memory, and then additionally here, some of the more, the additional love it's seeing from investors, uh, they say, and that kind of carries through to its higher expense valuation, or lower, more expense valuation, I should say. So those, a few of the names to watch from Alliance Bernstein and their call here around some of the Asia Pacific stocks here. Also, higher rates might be here to stay unless inflation comes down. That's according to Austin Goolsby, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago president. This comes after Rafael Bostic, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta Prez, striking a similar tone this week. He's calling for the Fed to hold off until the third quarter. That's counter to what markets are expecting, which is rate cuts starting in March. But that probability is down nearly 10% from the start of this week. Cameron Dawson, New Edge Wealth Chief Investment Officer, is here to tell us more on what to expect from the Fed and how that impacts our portfolios. Cameron, great to have you here with us this morning. First and foremost, let's start there. What is the read-through from even the movement, the announcements that we've seen in the Fed speak this week and, and how that could directly correlate into someone's portfolio even right now? Yeah, I think the Fed isn't willing to call victory on inflation yet, meaning that all the Fed speak has talked about needing to see more evidence before wanting to engage with rate cuts. The Fed is concerned that if you've seen things like financial conditions now be easier than they were when they started cutting rate or started hiking rates, that this could actually restoke inflation or cause growth to pick back up even further. And so the Fed does not want to claim that victory. It doesn't mean that they won't cut rates in 2024. It just means that they don't want to signal a big, huge easing cycle, which could be considered stimulative, mostly if growth holds up. So what we think that that means for portfolios is that there's an upward bias to yields. Yields move very far, very fast to the downside over the course of the fourth quarter. And we thought that there's probably upside to those yields because growth was holding in better than expected. Expected. Look at those retail sales today. So it means that we can't be complacent on inflation and we can't be complacent on the path of this expect expectation of ever lower yields. Cameron, for investors out there trying to figure out what exactly the Fed's next move means for their portfolio, how much of the focus should be on the timing of that first rate cut versus the pace of the cuts that we could see play out for the rest of 2024? I think it's the latter, which is that it's how many cuts. It's not necessarily a big deal if it comes in March or if it comes in May. I think the only thing about the timing would be a reflection of how much urgency that they thought that they needed to cut rates. If they decided to cut in March, maybe the market would look and say, is the Fed seeing something that we're not seeing, meaning that they're cutting because they feel that they really need to get going on a cutting cycle. That's not at all how the Fed has been talking lately in this pushing back against markets market pricing. So our view is that the Fed likely cuts three times in 2024. That would be consistent with other non-recessionary cutting cycles, times like 2019, 1998, 1995. Anything more than that likely requires a larger deterioration in economic data and a deterioration in the employment market, which still remains pretty firmly tight. Does the continued anticipation of a cut just lead to a furthering of a drift higher in tech? Yeah, I, it's a great question because if this was a year like 2022, we'd say that a tighter Fed should be bad for tech. But a year like 2023, we saw a huge tech multiple expansion, even as the Fed was tighter than expected and real rates rose. So tech really is benefiting from things outside of the Fed's impact. And it really comes down to the earnings line. Tech has had some of the best earnings revisions higher of, really the best earnings revisions higher of any sector within the S&P 
500. So the challenge with tech is really this balance or conflict from the reality that tech is a crowded trade. We've seen huge inflows into the tech sector over the course of 2023, where we've had outflows from every other sector. It's also an expensive sector. It's trading just about one term below its 2021 peak. So you're pricing in a lot of good news. But at the same time, you have that earnings revision, which helpful, hopefully will make those valuations a little less stressed. You have the earnings momentum and you have the stock momentum. Tech remains in a really strong uptrend on an absolute and relative basis. So for now, we respect the trend, we respect the earnings momentum, but it's another point. We don't want to be complacent on that crowded positioning and full valuations. So then Cameron, outside of tech and outside of what, what you're mentioning and some of the, the fixed income movements that you guys are expecting to see, but more so focusing on equities, where else are you seeing maybe an opportunity to bet on what have been maybe some of those beaten down names that did come back into favor at the end of 2023? Yeah, a great example of that would be in healthcare. We're seeing good trends in a turn from earnings deceleration in 2023 for healthcare to a big recovery and growth for earnings for the sector. It actually is expected to have some of the best earnings growth of all the S&P 500 sectors. It's under-owned. You saw big outflows over the course of 2023. You can look at ETF flows, and it looks like it's in contrarian territory, meaning that people have left it for dead. So we're looking for opportunities within health Healthcare, it screens more value. Uh, you have a lot of areas that are not trading at very extended valuations, but we also like some of the more growthy parts of healthcare as well. In biotech, given the fact that that entire sector in biotech has been effectively in a bear market for two years, we think that there's opportunity for M&A, capital deployment, mostly if people start feeling a little bit better and more optimistic about the outcome of the Fed and the economy. All right, Cameron Dawson, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Have a great weekend, New Edge Wealth Chief Investment Officer. Thanks. Thank you. All right, coming up, more from Yahoo Finance's morning brief. Meta doubling down on AI. How big of a catalyst is this going to be for the stock? You're looking at shares gaining 1.5%. The stock is up 180% in just the last year. More on that when we come back. Meta doubling down on artificial intelligence. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announcing the tech giant is pushing deeper into AI. It's going to require 
quote, massive compute infrastructure. And that means that Meta is going to build all this out using 350,000 graphic processing units, GPUs, from NVIDIA. And taking a look at share reaction here this morning, about 15 minutes into the trading day, you're looking at gains just about one and a half percent. We want to bring in Justin Patterson. He's KeyBank's Managing Director. Joining us now with more. And Justin, let's talk a little bit first just about what exactly this could mean for the stock price here for Meta going forward, because we know this is a name that certainly rebounded in 2023, shares up about 180 percent in just the last year. So how big of a catalyst do you see these AI plans of being for the stock? Yeah, it's a great question. When you look at 2023's performance, a lot of that was the year of efficiency, costs coming out of the business. Yes, you had some revenue reacceleration from reels, from currency in the back half. But as we look at 2024, this year is really more about revenue growth. So when you see these AI investments coming to the business, that's something that drives engagement on Meta, positions some new revenue streams, pricing growth from the ad side, and really starts to position Meta more as a competitor in that conversation with OpenAI and Google. Uh, so we're pretty bullish on Meta's AI moves here. I mean, coming off of a year of efficiency, I mean, they can't that quickly just go to a year of making it rain on AI, right? So what is the best way that investors can anticipate and kind of encapsulate how Meta Platforms is going to really give or set a theme for this year? Uh, it's funny you say making it rain. They were already making it rain last year. <laughs> you had uh, uh, roughly $28 billion in CapEx. You already have guidance for 30 to $35 billion. That's a lot of that AI investment. So we're going from, you know, call it slight downpour to bigger, bigger rainstorm this year. And you've seen some of that already happen within the AI, within the ad tech stack, where revenue growth started reaccelerating to 20% growth. A lot of that has been some of this AI investment driving better content recommendations, which you know, leads to more time spent within Reels and also gives more time, more opportunities to serve ads and drive that ad growth. So, so I think of this more as continuation of revenue growth, sustaining some of that initial foundation built in 2023. Justin, looking ahead to the uh, fourth quarter results that we're going to be getting here in just a couple of weeks, when it comes to AI initiatives, when it comes to some of Meta's other top priorities here for the coming year, what's the top thing or maybe top two things that you're going to be hoping to hear or want to hear from Zuckerberg? Yeah, so one would be just fleshing out this AI strategy some more. So uh, Mark in his comments yesterday teased, expect more to come. We will have the, the latest um, model, Llama 3, being worked on over the course of the year. There was some teasing of just uh, more connected devices in there. It sounds like the Ray-Ban product's going pretty well. So just how he's thinking about, you know, which inning of the AI investment we're in, what initial returns look like, so on and so forth. So I'd call that the AI bucket. The other side would just be, what is the health of the core core ad platform right now? It does look like the ad market continue to recover in Q4. We've seen some positive pre-announcements to start the year. So if this is another year where Meta's putting up, you know, call it mid-teens growth, since you've got tough comps in the back half, that, that'll be perceived as positively for investors. It's so funny that you mentioned the Ray-Ban product. For the first time, I actually had somebody, uh, when I was playing drums, come and get up in my face and say, hey, I'm recording you uh, over last weekend. So really interesting to hear that shouted out. Justin, when we think about the wearables, perhaps, inflection point and, and where that could come forward and ultimately for some of the headset products that, that Meta is going to lean further into and Apple, for their same right, is going to lean further into is it a, just a rising tide type of situation, or do you believe that there's one that has a better install base, stickier ecosystem that is going to kind of come out on top here? Yeah, I'd say really early days on that. We're talking a lot, 200,000 or so Vision Pro uh, shipments uh, for initial forecast out there. That's very, very tiny. But when we start talking about tens of millions, hundreds of millions of products, that's when this gets interesting. So if we're going back to just the innings analogy from baseball, we really haven't even thrown the first pitch yet. This is more long-term investment versus something you see as big drivers for these companies over the near term. Justin, let's turn our focus uh, to another company that I know is on your radar and are, are, is on a lot of our uh, audiences, our viewers here, Radar, and that's Netflix. You're going to be hearing results from them next week. You just raised your price target on the stock. Give us the top things that you are going to be looking for in Netflix's results next week. Yeah, definitely. So the big ones always turn into what is the pace of subscriber acquisitions, uh, which gives a sense of just how many new members are coming to the site. 
and starts to shape a piece of the revenue forecast. The other is pricing and monetization. So in the past, Netflix is really just a pricing driven story, ad free product was the entirety of the business. We've actually seen a lot of healthy signs from the ad product, the ad tier uh, into the back half. You saw 23 million monthly active users announced early January. That's up uh, from about 15 million in the November timeframe. So that's really starting to accelerate a bit more. So as you have both a larger ad free member base and a, a growing ad supported member base, we think that should drive a reacceleration to mid-teens growth over the course of the year for Netflix. How concerned should Netflix be about retaining their market share when you've got a company uh, in Disney has activist campaigns that are prompting it to achieve Netflix like margins of 15 to 20 percent by fiscal year 2027? What type of net impact does that even have for a company in Netflix from from your perspective? You know, I'd say neutral to positive, actually, since in Disney's case, it's got to start seeing more returns on some of these investments, stop subsidizing or stop investing aggressively in content, potentially even license some content. So for Netflix, having more competitors step back on the investment gas is a good thing because now Netflix's content investment can go a little bit further. It's not competing as hard for just signing up new customers. And if there's more content on Netflix to watch versus competitors, that's good for engagement, good for ad growth, good for supporting price increases. Justin, great to get some of your insights here on all of these very important tickers that we know our viewers are watching and tracking here closely on the Yahoo Finance platform. Justin Patterson, Key Bank Managing Director. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Certainly. Well, relief for thousands of American student loan borrowers today as the Biden administration announces it's going to wipe out nearly $5 billion in additional student loan debt. The move comes in the administration's larger push to fix what it's called a broken system. Alexis Keenan, Yahoo Finance reporter, is here to help us break this down. Hey, Alexis. Hi, guys. Yeah, so this is more debt relief on top of the student debt relief that we've already seen from the administration. Specifically, here are the numbers. It's approved for an additional $4.9 billion in student student loan debt to be wiped out. That will go for 73,600 borrowers. And what the administration is saying is that this reasoning is to fix inaccurate accounting by student loan servicers that got it wrong and didn't count borrowers' qualifying payments. Now, the borrowers who will see relief, specifically, they are those who are on the income-driven repayment plan. That's the plan that allows debt forgiveness after 20 to 25 years of qualifying payments, 29,700 individuals seeing relief there. The administration previously gave that similar relief in that uh, income-driven repayment plan to 800,000 borrowers. That was back in August. Also, 43,900 public service uh, plan participants. These are those borrowers who were going into public service when they entered the workforce and put in at least 10 years. Now, that brings the total number under the administration of debt wiped out for students to $136 billion, and that is for 3.7 million Americans. The U.S. Secretary of Education also saying in a statement that went out this morning that this is the first first time that these student loan payments are now accurately accounted for to give people this kind of relief. And remember, back in uh, June, uh, the Supreme Court had denied the administration's initial efforts to get rid of what was $400 billion in student debt relief. So this just another step in the administration's very wide effort to get rid of uh, these payments for all of these borrowers. All right, certainly a story we will continue to watch. Alexis, thanks. Well, coming up, more from Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief. We will get a vibe check on investing in Bitcoin spot ETFs and what demand looks like. Taking a look at the price of Bitcoin here, Bitcoin prices falling one week after the SEC approved the product. So we can take a look at iShares uh, spot Bitcoin ETF product. That's off about 16%. More on that when we come back.
BlackRock, BlackRock, excuse me, spot Bitcoin ETF. Try saying that 15 times fast. First time, first of the 11 approved spot Bitcoin ETFs to hit $1 billion in assets in its first four days of trading. That's according to data from JPM, JP Morgan. The competition and interest in the space is slowing shaping out, slowly shaping out here. Both BlackRock and Fidelity spot Bitcoin ETFs have been pulling the majority of inflows with investors drawn to the lower fees and name recognition here. Um, you're taking a look at some of the ETF price action that we've seen here on the day, at least. And Brad, we do see a lot of the excitement surrounding these two ETFs when you take into account BlackRock Fidelity. I do think the analyst is right there in terms of familiarity. It, investors trusting those names, that's probably why they're attracting much of the inflow. But let's take a look at the price of Bitcoin, because I also think that's interesting to pull mm -hmm. up within this conversation. We saw the massive run-up ahead of this approval. We had Bitcoin up just about 160% in the last year, amid a lot of this optimism that the funds would be approved and we would see this broadening out of demand. But since then, we take a look at that five-day chart, or at least over the last week, you can see that cooling just a bit. And the cryptocurrency has dropped about 11% following the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF. So not necessarily a huge surprise. We talked about time and time again that this would likely be a sell the news type of event, given the fact that there was so much anticipation, so much excitement surrounding the rumors of an approval. But what exactly this means for demand going forward is one of the big questions. And then beyond that, Right now, we do have 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs, but how many of these are going to survive? We had, did get some commentary out of Davos and over the last week just about the fact that we could see a number of these fail as we do see demand shake out a little bit. But we will see exactly what that picture looks like and also get a better sense of the investor appetite for ex for exposure to crypto. And understand if this leads us to an Ethereum ETF as yeah. well that eventually gets but Some applications are already starting to be submitted here, so we'll see where that nets out. And also important to note that this comes up ahead of the anticipated April Bitcoin halving event as well. So a question of how much of that is actually priced in right now, too. Yeah, certainly. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Coming up, we've got some more insight into the state of the housing market. Breaking existing home sales is going to be out in just two minutes. We've got that for you next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading session on this Friday. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Stocks are higher as tech companies continue their rally here this morning. You're taking a look at the S&P 500 there on your screen and ours too. It's up by about three tenths of a percent. Right, let's take a look at some of those individual names. Schlumberger getting a boost for, for, from its fourth quarter results today. Profit coming in just above a billion dollars. Company also seeing some strength in its international business revenue there, pushing ahead of North America, rising 18% from a year ago. And a strong quarter for insurance giant Travelers. The company saw double-digit percent increases in premiums for auto and home insurance, driving its revenue and profits higher in the most recent quarter. This came despite higher catastrophe losses, and that totaled about $3 billion in 2023. It's thanks to major storms and other extreme weather. All right, well, Travelers, the top performing uh, Dow stock, the second top performer is IBM, and taking a look at those moves, up nearly 2% ever core. Adding it here, or I should say upgrading the stock to outperform the analyst behind the call, saying that the company is, quote, well positioned to benefit from tailwinds in 2024, especially thanks to some of that momentum and some of the excitement investments surrounding AI. Now, we want to get to some breaking news on existing home sales and digging into those numbers. Is existing home sales sliding in the month of December off 1% on a monthly basis. This is according to the latest numbers that we're getting out here from the National Association of Realtors. Now, looking on an annual basis, existing home sales falling to the lowest level in nearly 30 years, down 6.2%. Not exactly a massive shock here, Brad. We've been talking about the fact that inventory has remained very low. A lot of people who are in these homes not moving because of the fact that, in, that mortgage rates have jumped so much. It doesn't make sense financially for them to move out of their existing homes. So I also want to bring up the median home price and some of the trends that we are seeing there because the median existing home sales price rising 4.4% from a year ago in December, rising to 382,600. Now this is the sixth month in a row that we're seeing the year over year price increases. A lot of that driven by the lack of inventory, therefore pushing up the pricing of these homes. Yeah, $382,600, the sixth consecutive month of year over year price increases, as you were mentioning there a moment ago, and the median price reached a record high of $389,800 in 2023. So ultimately here, as you think about what the the read through here in total housing inventory as well, that was down 11.5%. Also some context on this, mortgage rates had actually fell to their lowest level in about eight months. And so as you think about the housing market here, it's a question of where some of the read through and existing home and the people who are sitting on top of homes, because yes, to get into a new home, it's going to be more expensive, or at least on the rate side, than when you may have locked in that ultra low mortgage rates. Historical comps, I I think are where the market is going to really start looking at where it seems like there could be perhaps in the silver tsunami and even in some of the early uh, re-entering millennial buyers where there could be a re-entry there. Because if you're looking at some of those higher levels that we had seen um, by historical standards, we're still well below those even at this rate right yeah. now. Well, let's talk a little bit more about existing home sales. Existing home sales continue to fall in December as home prices remain elevated. This comes as mortgage rates continue their downward trend, now well below 7% for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. This move in rates boosted home builder confidence, but is it enough to bring buyers and sellers back into the market? Joining us now, we've got Lawrence Yoon, who is the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist. Lawrence, your ears must have been burning here because we were just talking about you and the team's report and the reading here. First, if, if there's one high level takeaway that you can kind of use to encapsulate this market that you're seeing right now, what would it be? Well, thank goodness that 2023 is over uh, <laughs> because this year already uh, we are seeing a stir of interest among buyers responding to those low interest rates. The mortgage purchase applications are up. The opening of the lock boxes to view homes are up. Uh, and our realtor members are indicating they're getting more phone calls. So people are responding. I think the worst in home sales is pretty much over. Uh, and interestingly, you know, the because of lack of supply, home prices continue to rise. So for 85 million homeowning families across the country, they are smiling. They have seen their housing wealth rise. I think the frustration is really with the first-time buyers, really difficulty. But now with interest rates dropping, 
providing some relief to reach YD market. So, Lawrence, do you think that this is the bottom here then for existing home sales? Uh, for the home sales, uh, yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, pretty much the bottom. Uh, every time interest rate drops, after two, three months, there's always a response. So we know that interest rate was high at 8% back in October, but since then it has come down. So this is almost three straight months of interest rate decline, and we do anticipate that the buyers would be responding to this. But in addition, I think the sellers will be responding. I think there are many sellers who have been delaying, delaying their decision to move when the interest rates were high, but with interest rate now coming down, they say, well, the cost of giving up my low interest rate well, there's a little pain involved, but not greatly as if the mortgage rates were 8%. So I think more supply will also come. Yeah, and Lawrence, and also to point out the massive run-up, right, that we've seen in home prices, given the fact that inventory is so low. So those that are still out there on the market or in the market trying to buy these homes have really boosted uh, the pricing of some of these homes. What, you, what is your sense just in terms of what that pricing activity then is going to look like? Uh, you know, the inventory condition is still low. 1 million homes available out there currently, 1 million. But this is an improvement from one year ago. Now, I would like to see 2 million homes on the market so consumers are given wider choices. There will be less hurried decision, you know, without that intense multiple offer situation. Uh, but with increased demand, naturally, that's going to begin to put uh, upward pressure on the prices unless we have more supply. Good thing that builders are ramping up production. And furthermore, I think some of the delayed home uh, sellers will begin to reach the market this year. So overall, I see the growth in inventory throughout this year. Maybe we get 30 or 40% more listing. That's clearly welcoming trend, giving the first time buyers a better chance to enter the market. Yeah, big home sales energy this morning, Lawrence, as we think about as well, the Redfin report that pending home sales rose 4% in December. That's the biggest jump in over two years, they say, and really citing the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate falling uh, to 6.82% in December from that 7.44% in November, that driving people back into the market here. Is there one specific cohort that you would say we need to see enter back into the home buying market in order for us to see a, a larger or continued shift? Uh, the latest data show 29% of all buyers being first-time buyers. That is too low. We need to see that figure at 35%. And furthermore, the age of the first-time buyers, which recently has been uh, in the uh, mid-30s, we want to see that entry point, the age when people enter as a first-time buyers, close to the more uh, age of 30, which used to be the case. It's because we want that home ownership opportunity, the American dream opportunity for more Americans, and starting from, uh, you know, at a, a young adulthood, in their late 20s, early 30s. So if we see that, then we clearly know the path is going in the right direction. Lawrence, on the, on the new home side, though, and, and we've been talking about existing homes quite a bit, but new homes as well, are, are we still behind in the number of homes that need to be produced in order for there to be ample supply for potential new home buyers to get into? You know, the new home construction market actually will squeak out. It looks like they're going to squeak out again this past year because they can create inventory. But the amount of creation of inventory is still insufficient, especially in light of decade of underproduction. Mm -hmm. So to compensate for decade of underproduction, the builders need to quickly ramp up production. America has a housing shortage. You know, people, uh, especially the renters, are burdened with high rent. The potential first-time buyers, they're looking at record high home prices. Only way to alleviate the price pressure is to have more supply. So everything to us assure that we have more supply coming onto the market, maybe less regulation, maybe looking at the rezoning rules. Uh, so anything to provide more facilitation for construction that will be good for America and for economic activity. All right, Lawrence, you and always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on here and joining us for this breaking news. National Association of Realtors Chief Economist. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you.
I want to get to some more breaking news, and that's on consumer sentiment. We're looking at a huge jump in the month of January, reaching the highest level that we have seen since 2021, far exceeding the expectations from Wall Street. And taking a look into exactly what we're seeing from this index, rising 9.1 points to 78.8. Putting that in perspective, it's the biggest month-over-month -month jump that we have seen since 2005. And wrapping in inflation expectations into all this, and this uh, the latest here from the University of Michigan, but inflation expectations also coming in a bit lower here. Consumers expecting prices to climb at a rate of 2.9% on a year-over-year -year basis. That's down from 3.1% a month earlier. So more positive here on some progress in terms of inflationary pressures, therefore leading to higher confidence and at least cons a consumer sentiment at this point in the new year. Yeah, it's really going to be interesting, especially going forward, where among consumers, the sentiment continues to move in specific categories. I mean, we've gotten a good reading on the consumer over the course of this week, whether it be retail sales, whether it be some of the earnings that have started to trickle through. And one of the interesting kind of takes that we had even received earlier this week from the former CEO of Hudson's Bay, former CEO of Toys R Us, um, Jerry Storch, was just in those categories of weakness that the consumer is still pushing back. And department stores seem like they're still going to suffer in the midst of that. And then additionally, you think about some of those home and appliance stores. They're going to be under pressure as well here. So that might be one particular sentiment read through where consumers are still pushing back on price or just don't need to replenish a refrigerator that they just got two years ago uh, or a new lawnmower, which spells out bad news perhaps for John Deere for Toro, uh, even though John Deere has some new uh, artificial intelligence, more large cool. scale things that yeah, they got going on. Which, good luck to him on that. That was on full display at CES. Too. Yeah, at the day. Anyway, coming back to the consumer here on the end of the day, um, I think that's exactly where Jerry Storch was pointing to. There may be continued weakness, uh, and we'll see what that flow through means for some of the sentiment numbers as yeah, well. Yeah, but certainly a massive jump here and just taking into account a lot of the optimism around the Fed cut, a lot of the yeah. optimism that the Fed has really made progress in taming inflation. So consumers are still spending but whether or not it's going to hold up, of course, is the question everyone's asking. I'm right trying now. to buy a John Deere AI. Uh, well, I mean, I don't even purchase. know what the thing is. The, yeah, the lawnmower, yeah. Uh, I got to get a lawn first. All right, we're going to be getting more market action ahead. Also digging into the auto space with some new calls out on Hertz and a conversation with Carl Brower, executive analyst at iccars.com. We see him soon on the strength of electric vehicles and more. That's coming up.
Well, Ford announcing today that it is going to reduce production of its F-150 Lightning pickup truck. Now, the, cutting, the cuts kick off April 1st at the automaker's Michigan plant. One of the Michigan plants there is going to affect about 1,400 workers at the plant. Now, the reason why we are seeing these cuts, a lot of it being attributed to the slowdown in EV demand. Not necessarily a massive surprise. And taking a look at this release, Ford CEO Jim Farley saying that, quote, we are taking advantage of our manufacturing flexibility to offer customers choices while while balancing our growth and profitability. We want to say that they love the F-150 Lightning, America's best-selling EV pickup truck, but they are making adjustments there. So more, I guess, better bringing in production with consumer demand, bringing that in the line. And then I also want to note out within this release, it's also important to mention that Ford said it is going to be increasing production of its Bronco SUV and its Ranger pickup. Look, that Bronco is just sexy. I hope I can say that. Look, that thing gets you hot and steamy real quick. But at the end of the day, you think about the electric truck with sales up 55% in 2023. Yeah, it's the F-150 uh, Lightning here, and they called that out within this release as well. However, it does come back to customer demand. I think there are two big hangups right now. Sometimes, yes, it can be on price compared to the ICE combustion engine, but then you're also thinking about, well, what else is at play there? And it's the supercharger network that they are all building out and adopting to the North American charging standard as well, NACS. And so all of that considered, the charging network which has gotten a ton of capital thrust towards it, both from the political side and, and more broadly public policy stance, and then additionally here from the auto vehicle manufacturers and making sure that there is that accessibility to the same extent one day that you could simply go down the road and find a gas station uh, within any way you look as you would kind of sample and think back to the famous theme song for everybody's favorite sitcom. Well, maybe not everybody's, but anyway, at the end of the day, Ford here, uh, we're continuing to watch shares here this morning and we'll see exactly where they continue to move on this news. Yeah, it's also worth just putting these production numbers into a context here. The sales here were up 55% last year, more than 24,000 pickups. But remember, Ford have been targeting 150,000 production, 150,000 production right here for 2024. So adjusting that to be bring it better in line with what demand looks like. All right, well, as Ford cuts production of its all-electric pickup due to slowing EV demand, the Biden administration announcing new investments to trim the cost of EVs for Americans has also built out infrastructure. Some customers, though, might be wondering if an electric vehicle is still worth it. People are finding that the low temperatures are draining EV back batteries in an unanticipated and in an unanticipated rising issue. Rental firm Hertz Global will be selling around 20,000 EVs not directly tied to what we are seeing play out with the cold weather and the impact that that is having on EVs, but that is tied to demand. So let's talk about all of this. We want to bring in Carl Brower. He's executive analyst here at iccars.com to dig into this a little bit more. And Carl, let's start with the news of the day, and that's the latest out of Ford, the F-150 Lightning pickup. What's your read into that and really what that tells us more about the broader story about EV demand and the fact that it's not living up to those initial expectations? Yeah, I think we've reached a point in the marketplace where the early adopters, the people who really want to um, buy a zero emissions vehicle, you know, there, there's various demographics that we're into and are interested in EVs, and they seem to have all gotten their EV. And obviously that's not a static thing. There's, there's constant churn going on there. But it does seem like we've got to break past that segment of the population into the mainstream buyer, the average consumer. And the average consumer is going to be less concerned about or thinking about emissions or even torque and uh, all the electric vehicle benefits. They're going to be thinking about their cost upfront, their cost ongoing while they own it, their depreciation when it's time to sell it. And after this past week, probably things like what's going to happen when it gets really cold if I'm driving one. You know, Carl, we, we talk so much about a crypto winter. Maybe we need to start talking about an EV winter as well. There, there's some similar characteristics in customer demand and where the production is going to shift towards as well. Is, is it possible that we are in an EV winter? And then who kind of emerges and what's the catalyst that gets us out of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that we've hit again this kind of market share stabilization point when we ic cars did a study and we looked at the market share of evs across the country and in cities and what we saw was that it was growing much quicker in cities or, or states that had less than say five percent share but states like california and oregon and washington that already had between seven and ten percent share didn't grow very much at all there so i think it's much easier to get to that first seven percent 
seven to nine percent than it is to get from say nine to 11 or 12 or 13 percent and i think that's what we're hitting right now on a national level and that's just that's just one element then you've got so many other elements too people you know considering their extreme uses you know and i think that's where people are starting to see what happened in chicago and they think to themselves look you can make the argument all day long that the average person only drives 30 miles a day and that the range isn't an issue and they can all charge at home on an average day all those things are true ask Chicagoans, what happens when the temperature is an average? Ask any EV owner what happens when a friend or a relative or some emergency comes up and you've got to go 200 or 300 miles in a day instead of 30 or 40 miles in a day. And, you know, those, those conditions might not be common, but we all know that Americans typically buy for their max use case. And if they think that things change from average to, to non-average or extreme and things fall apart, they're not going to want to buy a vehicle that has that circumstance. Carl, talk to us a little bit more for those who maybe aren't fully uh, familiar with uh, the reason as to why this is happening. Why are Teslas, why are other EV vehicles struggling so much in this cold weather? Obviously tied to the batteries, but walk us through exactly what's happening. Yeah, I mean, in a battery situation, you've got a bunch of chemicals and they're liquid and they have to move around inside the battery from when they're discharging and you're using it to when they're recharging. And when it gets cold, most fluids don't move around as much easily and that's the most simple way to think about it is the cold weather slows down everything from the electric flow from the charger into the to the battery and then it slows down the ability of the battery to flow from charge to discharge state and since that's all been hindered by colder temperature your ranges drop uh, to an extreme level and and you know people will often say well Cars don't get as good a gas mileage in extreme hot or cold weather. You know, trucks can't tow as far in a, when they're when they're carrying a lot of load. You know, the F-150 Lightning's range falls off a cliff basically when you use it as a real truck, and that's all true. My response to that is always that's right. And when you have an energy problem in an internal combustion engine, you solve it in ten minutes. You look around, you look on your app. Oh, there's a gas station. Boom, seven to ten minutes later, you're done. That's not what happens in an EV, and I think a lot of these recent stories are starting to really illustrate that. Well, Carl, so then if if a viewer is sitting at home, they have an EV. What are some of the things? Can they do anything to prevent these issues? Or I guess what's the best workaround for them in terms of how they should be approaching this other than, I guess, charging it at every chance you get? Yeah, you know, you can do preconditioning. The automakers have got smarter about things. So if you've got a level two charger at your house and it's parked overnight and it's cold the next day, get the car warmed up before you ever unplug it. Get the Get the car's ambient temperature and everything in the cabin up to temperature before you ever discharge from the disconnect from the grid in your garage and you are, are burning a bunch of energy when you're off the grid to get the car warmed up so preconditioning is one thing and again just just really thinking about where you've got to go and how far you've got to go and take into account you might have 30 plus percent less range when you go there and some maybe a friend's borrowing a friend's car something like that if you're really in an extreme weather situation like chicago I would reconsider other alternatives besides your EV. Carl, some great reminders. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning on Yahoo Finance. Carl Brower, who is the executive analyst at iccars.com. Thanks. Thank you. Well, after mixed regional bank earnings this week, who are this season's biggest winners and losers? More on this after the break. You can't talk streaming wars without talking Netflix. The company that once sent you a DVD in the mail is still the industry leader, but when fourth quarter results hit on January 23rd, there are three key issues that shareholders will be watching. First up, subscriber growth, still the granddaddy of them all. That all-important metric will stand out as the true measure of success. Last time out, Netflix shocked the street by adding almost 9 million subscribers in the third quarter. That was the biggest net ad since the COVID era when we were all stuck at home binge-watching Riverdale. It was also a sign that crackdown on password sharing was creating full-paying subscribers. Can the trend continue? Then there's pricing. In the third quarter, Netflix announced increases across some key regions. The recently phased out basic plan went from $9.99 to $11.99, and the premium plan from $19.99 to $22.99. The recession didn't happen, but can the average American still afford this along with the daily pistachio latte? Of course, you can't talk about pricing without discussing the much-heralded ad-supported plan. Launched over a year ago, it now boasts 15 million monthly active users. Can momentum continue to build there? 
And last but not least, content. It's still king, and Netflix and its competitors are nothing without the shows and movies that keep you unsociable all year round. Spending on content creation is expected to land at around $17 billion this year. That number was skewed last year thanks to the impact of the Hollywood writer's strike. Remember that? The push for original material has been a big part of the strategy for co-CEOs Ted Sarandos and Greg Peters, but could increased licensing deals be the smarter play for the company? How much importance will be placed on local language unscripted series? We'll also be listening out for any mention of how gaming could be a much bigger part of the strategy going forward. Does all this set us up for a strong report? Wedbush analyst Alicia Reese thinks the company has the right formula now. Do you agree? Lots to discuss. We'll build up to the report and break it all down the moment it hits here on Yahoo Finance. Regional banks have been reporting mixed earnings this week, with several banks showing sizable drops in profits. For more on the quarter and what we can expect from regional banks this year, David Hollerith, Yahoo Finance reporter, is here. Hey, David, you've been tracking across the board with these regional banks. Hey, Brad, yeah. Uh, you know, the bright side here is that uh, for the regional banks, their stock prices um, and deposit levels uh, are were much ended 2023 on much more uh, stable footing, we could say. But there's been no small amount of struggle we've seen um, in earnings over the past week. And the going isn't go necessarily getting any easier. Uh, two regional bank indexes are down about 5% since the beginning of January as of this morning, as an example. 
Q4 profits uh, have been down um, compared to a year ago across the board. And this is due in part uh, to the FDIC special assessment fee, which most of Wall Street knew was coming. This is same for the big banks. Most of the banks have chosen to take that as a one-time charge this quarter. But more importantly, most of these lenders still saw their margin shrink compared to past quarters and last year. And that trend's uh, expected to continue to uh, to worsen next year. Um, and this is all given the fact that um, interest rates, until interest rates change, um, banks are expecting higher deposit costs and uh, potentially more uh, charges in their credit costs. And so, David, which banks have stood out as the strongest and, and on the other side, most challenged perhaps? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Fifth Third Bank, which uh, reported this morning, uh, is a bit of an outlier. Um, they're talking about doing share buybacks this year, which is not something you hear outside of from uh, you know the biggest, most profitable banks. They also have sort of made a, a point um, not to brand themselves as a growth bank, which, as we know from last year, uh, the banks that failed all had previously kind of been more growthy uh, type banks. Um, on the more challenged side, uh, Dallas, Texas-based Comerica is a great example of, you know, the struggles that um, uh, regional banks have been facing and will continue to face by margin stock price and their future outlook. Um, things are going to continue to be tough for them. Um, they they saw sizable margin declines in their net interest income and also deposit um, declines compared to a year ago for this quarter. And they're not expecting um, this, this next year to be much better. Um, so again, regional banks are, are dealing with a lot less deposits compared to the big banks um, since the crisis that happened in the spring of last year. All right, David Haller, thanks so much for breaking down the latest on that number of uh, trending tickers there on Yahoo Finance today. All right, let's get to another uh, top story here for the new year and even for uh, the next several years here. The new bipartisan proposal unveiled in Washington this week could potentially boost the child tax credit. This would affect taxpayers this year. Now, the proposal coming as a child care crisis worsens in the U.S. There's new data out from Care.com that found that a third of American parents are draining their savings just to afford child care. Here with more on that, we want to bring in Brad Wilson. He's Care.com's CEO. Brad, it's great to have you here. So let's talk about what is being proposed on Capitol Hill and then tie that in to what you found in your latest uh, data that you have out here. So there's a new plan on Capitol Hill. It plans to include $33 billion to partly extend a major expansion of the child tax credit that was initially allocated for just one year. Talk to us just about how much of that would really help what is going on here. And, and if we don't see this approval, how much worse this child care crisis could potentially get? Hey, thanks for having me this morning. Well, look, what I would say is that it certainly helps, but I only think it gets us part of the way there. So we're really pleased that the government is is leaning back into some form of, of help for American families with child care. But I think the proposal that they're suggesting, which would essentially put about $2,000 per child uh, of tax credit with American families, that's short of what was issued in the pandemic era of around $3,500 uh, per child, per family. So in effect, it will help. Uh, I think what we're seeing and, and what has been suggested is that if you're making between $10,000 and $50,000 per year, the Tax Policy Center decided that this will save uh, roughly about $1,100 for American families. And of course, a lot of this research also suggests that this would lift a lot of families out of poverty. And I think the, the running number right now is about 400,000, uh, excuse me, 400,000 children. So it's a start, but I think, you know, the data that we certainly see in our cost of care reports uh, suggest that we need a whole lot more. And so with that in mind, I mean, we've also seen companies try to enact even more uh, within some of their employment offerings to make sure that they can also help with that or even provide facilities. What do we need to see in both of those efforts, both in facilities that come online as well as in, in company efforts to, to help some of their employees with this matter? Yeah, that, that's right. So, so we see that as well. So a lot of employees are asking their employers to have more holistic care. And so while on-site or near-premise facilities are certainly fashionable and certainly needed, 
Um, what we're also seeing though really is a lot of employees and their families want more flexible care and choice. And so 91% of our families survey and our surveyed in our recent cost of care report have had to make alternate work arrangements as a result of childcare and the impact uh, that, that having children have had on their families. And so what that all often means is they need more flexible work arrangements. And it also means that they need in-home care as well. So a lot of the policy and the child care uh, and, and dependent care block grants that have been issued for, through the government really have focused on mostly in-center uh, care. And a lot of what uh, many companies previously had offered was really around center-based care. But I think more and more what we're seeing is that whether it's government or enterprises, there's this flexibility that's desired by employees and American families. And that's that's certainly what we've, we've been helping with and, and taking a leadership position in. And Brad, the trends that we have seen, child care service at cost, they've soared. They're increasing more than twice the overall inflation rate in just 2023. If this issue isn't addressed, how much more do you think people could potentially be be paying for child care then over the coming years? Yeah, let, let, let me hit a couple couple stats because you, you mentioned it. But over we've done this study now for 11 years. And what we found and what we typically track are costs and, and, and the impact it has on American families but also we take a look at macro trends. So since we've been doing this report for 11 years, daycare costs, nanny costs, and family center care costs have all risen between 60 and 80% over that 11 year period. To put that in perspective, uh, inflation over a 10 year period uh, in a cumulative fashion has been around 30%. So the costs have been exorbitant. And, and really what's happening is not only are the costs rising, um, but you're seeing availability lessen as a result of the pressure on very thin margin daycare centers. And so that's creating less availability for American families, which is forcing them to explore alternate options, which is why I mentioned some of the in-home care and flexible arrangements that we talked about. So um, in short, I think when you're when you're when you're asking American families to pay twenty four percent of their household income, which is what we find in our report, and now what we're learning is greater than one third of American families are dipping into savings. This is a major economic issue. And so there needs to be some form of contract between families, government and enterprise to solve this, because if families are depleting their income and their savings, that's money that's not going back into the economy. And that's going to hurt overall growth for for the U.S. Uh, economy. Brad, to what extent do you expect child care to be on the ballot in 2024 in the general elections? It, 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 it certainly will be on the ballot. I think what we see in our report is that a great majority of families have suggested that uh, child care is a key issue for the upcoming presidential election. In fact, only the economy was cited as an issue uh, more important to them. So I think we will see this as, as something front and center and that people will be advocating for. And of course, we know that this current administration has made it a bit, a bit of a, a point of emphasis with the uh, executive order last year on child care, which essentially directs the, the Department of Health and Human Services to affect policy to create more consistent and quality and, and affordable child care. Um, the Republican candidates have been a little more vague on their policy. We've seen the questions asked in recent town halls and uh, the, the specifics around their details and what they would support are certainly lacking. So I think it's going to be a prevalent issue and I think you'll see more and more discussion on it in the upcoming debates. Brad Wilson, Care.com CEO. Brad, we appreciate the time here on the matter. Thanks so much. All right, great. Great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Coming up, everyone, Apple fans finally get a chance to ensure that they'll get their hands on the new version of the Pro headset. We find out if it's worth the hype. That's next.
Oil prices moving higher this morning as tankers carrying 9 million barrels of oil from Saudi Arabia and Iraq are delayed as they change course to avoid the Red Sea. This comes amid ongoing tensions, according to Bloomberg. Now, joining us now with the latest on some of the movement that we're seeing, it is Ness Frey standing by at the big board. And Ness, we're looking at oil just around 74, at least crude, around 74 bucks a barrel. Yeah, that's right, Shauna. And that is uh, crude is jumping because of these Red Sea tensions that we have seen over the last couple of weeks. And I just want to add that when we talk about these vessels that are making their way around the Cape of Africa, that means that they are now extending their trip by about two weeks. And something very important also with respect to these developments is that when we first started hearing about these Houthi rebel attacks on vessels, it was mainly on vessels that were perhaps carrying goods, the oil-related vessels could still travel through. But over the last week or so, we have seen more and more companies saying that they are avoiding that area altogether. You just had a Danish company last week that has about 80 vessels that carries refined products. They are going to be also diverting away from the Red Sea. Uh, you had Shell recently that said that it is going to avoid that area. So it's starting to really impact these transports of oil and oil-related products. So you're looking at WTI that today is up about uh, half of a percent. Brent crude pushing up towards that $80 per barrel uh, level. And these are about three-week highs. So you've got two things going on with the markets, and this is what we've seen over the last several weeks. You've got the tensions in the Middle East, the tensions in that Red Sea. And then you also have concerns about oversupply, concerns about more supply coming into the markets, the outlook in China, perhaps perhaps if their demand is not as great as what analysts had been expecting. So you have these two sort of counter forces when it comes to these oil prices, guys. All right. And as thanks so much for breaking that down and continuing to monitor some of the price action there. Also, everyone switching gears. The Apple Vision Pro is officially available for pre-order. U.S. Apple fans can officially put in their orders to receive the new mixed reality headset when it is available in stores on February 2nd. But hefty price tag. $3,500. Is it accessible enough to be the next big thing for the tech giant? That's the big question. Bank of America seems to think so. An analyst writing in a note Thursday, the Vision Pro can be a meaningful new device for Apple, helping to drive revenue for the company. Our next guest had the chance to slip on that Vision Pro headset and try it out. We've got Victoria Song, the Verge senior reviewer of wearables. Victoria, got to know your takeaway here. Hi, good morning. Hey, good morning. Is it, so is it worth it? 3500 bucks. I, you know, that's really going to depend on what you think about VR because, you know, Apple's calling this their spatial computing device, uh, but for all intents and purposes, if you've used a VR headset, this is very similar. It's just got that Apple take on it, which means, you know, the screens are very high res. It's two separate 4K screens that are being like zoomed straight into each eyeball. So, you know, it's it's a lot. It's it's very hard to actually describe what it looks like when you're in the, the actual uh, demo. And I only had 30 minutes with it. You know, obviously other reporters are also getting control to demos like I did, but you know, if you're a believer in Apple and if you have any sort of curiosity with VR, I think you will probably very be very impressed by what the Vision Pro has to offer. Victoria, we just had a full screen up on the uh, up on the screen that's comparing Apple's device to some of the other products that are out there on the market right now. What what we've heard from uh, Meta specifically, how do you think Apple's headset stacks up to some of its competitors? Well, um, one thing is that I will say this is the most high resolution uh, VR headset that I've ever tried. There were points where I was looking in the demo and I was like, oh my God, I'm on top of a volcano and the rock is extremely textured. Like I wasn't expecting to see the texture of the rock. That said, um, I, you know, I got some time with Meta's most recent Quest headsets and they're quite good for a fraction of the price. So it's really, what do you wanna do in mixed reality? What do you wanna do in VR? That's going to kind of define whether or not you think the Vision Pro is worth it. One thing I'll say is that when I put it on, it felt very familiar immediately, just because there's a digital crown, which is very similar to the Apple Watch. And then the interface itself is very similar to using a Mac, just in a different space. So like that's that's one thing. Um, another thing is we didn't really get to try any games. So if gaming is your first priority, you may want to just stick with a, a Meta Head Quest. 
Victoria, in terms of priority that this is going to be for Apple down the line and the fact that this could potentially, Bank of America making the argument that it could potentially boost sales of iPhone uh, over the next couple of years, given the fact that people are going to be upgrading their phones to better be able to use some of this latest uh, AR and VR AI type of capability here. When it comes to that demand and how big of a driver this could be for Apple's revenue down the line, what are you hearing or what are you expecting? You know, that's really hard to say just because this is a new category. Anytime, you know, people like myself have looked at a new Apple category when it launches, there's a tendency to go like, oh, who's going to use that, right? Like there were people who were skeptic of the iPhone. There were people who were skeptics of the Apple Watch and for the iPad. And largely they were proven wrong, right? But sometimes it takes a while to get there. This is a very emerging category. It's extremely nascent. The price tag is pretty big, right? Um, and from what I saw of the spatial videos and the spatial photos, you know, I don't think we necessarily as a culture know what we want from those things. So it's gonna be a matter of early adopters globbing on first and seeing what they have to say. But as for the average person, I think it's gonna take a while. Uh, I think it's gonna take Apple a while to figure out how they want the average person to view this device and how they want to use it. App developers are going to have to get on board and mass and while there's going to be a lot of apps available at launch you know there's a question as to how much are going to be natively available for vision os so this is sort of a wait and see type of thing and it's a lot of how much do you want to bet against apple given their track record and then how much do you believe in vr so it's it's a wishy-washy answer but i wouldn't bet against apple but it's it's this is kind of the most far out of left field that they've gone in a long time Victoria, I'm curious, you've closely followed Apple now for quite some time. The ruling that we got earlier this week, upholding the initial ruling, banning Apple from selling uh, its Apple Watches with a blood oxygen sensor. In terms of what this could mean for future product innovation down the line, or maybe how this could potentially change, or do you think it's going to change how Apple incorporates some technology into its products beyond, obviously, just this technology? Um, it might. They might be a little more careful with how they go about licensing the tech, but Apple is Apple. They, I don't think, are going to change their strategy with regards to patents. You know, they are the most sued company in Silicon Valley. So this is just kind of different in that, you know, normally Apple wins these cases. This is one of the first times we're seeing them kind of face some consequences. Um, but I'm not sure they're going to change their strategy going forward. I think we will eventually see blood oxygen return in some capacity to the Apple Watches, right? Um, it's not a fully fledged feature on any wearable yet, but at the same time, Massimo's patents only go for another couple years. So after that, it's going to be, it's going to be fair game. So we'll just have to see how this adapts over time. The appeal is still ongoing. It could be that the appeals court rules in Apple's favor, in which case we'll all have blood oxygen back relatively soon. So it's it's another case of we'll have to see how it plays out in the court. All right, Victoria Song, great to have you here. The Verge is senior reviewer of wearables. Thanks so much, Victoria. Thank you. We've got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, a trending story involving Boeing for investors of tickers BA and GE to monitor. An Atlas Air Boeing 747 cargo plane had to make an emergency landing at Miami International Airport late Thursday after the crew reported an engine failure. Yahoo Finance has re obtained a statement from the FAA on the matter, and ultimately, they said it returned safely to Miami International Airport around 10.30 p.m. local time. They're in further investigating the matter. Uh, it seems no one was injured within this. However, it does as come as Boeing has been under spotlight most recently. This was a Boeing 747-8F, and the reason that we also mention shares of GE, GE also manufactures and supplies that engine for this particular aircraft here. And in the social media video that is going viral here this morning and, and making the rounds. People who were seeing this flight in midair saw one of the engines catch fire. That is noted within the report. Uh, again, it does not seem that anyone was injured within this and the crew was able to return it to the ground as well after that engine failure. Yeah, and I think just investors, shareholders are on edge right now in terms of any developments of something pertaining to this, any sort of issue with any of Boeing's uh, model planes here because of the developments and everything that has played out really over the last several years, but in particular what has happened over the last two weeks and bringing you all up to speed in terms of where that stands. We do know that obviously the door on the pedal of the 737 MAX 9 plane that did blow off on an Alaska Airlines flight initially caused a pretty uh, stark reaction in the stock here. This Boeing stock was under pressure for several days as a result of that. As of this week on Wednesday, we had FAA officials saying that an initial round of inspections of 40 Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes have been completed. They The inspections continue uh, for many of the other uh, models that are on or many of the other planes within that model that are being operated right now or are owned at least by United and by Alaska Airlines. But again, this having some impact, it looks like on the stock, not too big of a reaction in shares today, off just about two tenths of a percent, but certainly important to bring up in the context of what has played out with Boeing over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and in the aftermath of the particular incident that you were mentioning a moment ago with the Alaska Airlines operated Boeing 737 MAX 9 airplane during flights, we actually, on the reaction to that, did get a uh, comment from Delta CEO Ed Bastian. That was last week saying he has full faith in Boeing. And so as we're continuing to monitor Boeing, of course, this is going to be one of the more kind of sensitive topics that anyone taking to the sky, but more notably, anyone who just believes that this company can continue to turn around or correct these issues is going to be watching very closely. Here. Yeah, when you compare the numbers, the delivery numbers here for at least 2023, Airbus, their long-term rival here, announcing last month that it delivered more aircraft and also had more orders than Boeing in 2023. So certainly another thing for investors to keep in mind. All right, let's do a quick check of the markets. 90 minutes into the final trade day of the week. We're still looking at gains across the board. The Dow up just over 100 points. The Nasdaq up about a half of a percent. Many of the tech stocks outperforming once again today. Rochelle Kufo and Akiko Fujita have you for the next hour. Have a great weekend.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance and happy Friday. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita alongside Rochelle Akufo. Here's what we're watching at this hour. Tech stocks giving the Nasdaq a boost, but does the AI spurred rally have more room to run? We'll discuss. Indeed, and an antitrust crackdown. iRobot shares plunging today after the Wall Street Journal reported the EU plans to reject Amazon's bid for the company. Plus, crisis averted, at least for now. The government has extended funding again, but a looming shutdown date still remains. Indeed, but first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. All three in the green, and we can see the Dow there up about a third of a percent, or about 113 points. Looking at the S&P as well, up about a third of a percent, about 15 points. Utilities, though, taking the biggest hit, of course, tech leading the sector action. And if you look over a five-day period, same situation there with tech leading the way utilities are lagged. So as we look at the tech heavy Nasdaq there, up about half a percent on the day, or about 70 points. Let's also take a look at how this week of earnings and data has affected the Treasury markets as well. We're looking at the five year up about 0.9 percent there, about 0.84, sitting above 408 there. The 10 year still climbing above that above that 4 percent mark, as we can see, sitting at 417, up just ever so slightly today, about point, up 0.65 percent. And the longest term 30 year just barely turning positive there, sitting at 438. Well, it must be deja vu. AI hype returns to the markets. We see that the Nasdaq 100 continues its climb this morning after closing at a record high on Thursday as investors jump back into those tried and tested Magnificent Seven stocks that, of course, dominated 2023. Well, joining us now with the latest moves in the tech sector is our very own Jared Blickery. Hey, Jared. Thank you, Rochelle. Deja vu all over again. Look at this. This is a sector action today. Tech and communication services filled with mega caps. Those are the leading sectors. Also add finance to that. And then you take a look at the year to date, uh, tech, communication services, and then healthcare. Healthcare is a, a bit of an addition this year. I was taking a look at who was leading last year at this point, uh, 13 trading days into the year. And it was tech and communication services, but also materials and energy. And if you take a look here, materials and energy, energy this year are the worst performers. So although we do have some similar leadership at the top, it is a little bit different once you start getting into the meat, into the meat there. And let me just show you what's going on in the AI sphere. I think this is pretty interesting. Um, this is our market cap weighted heat map. This is what's going on year to date. And you can see it's really about the larger names here. And it's almost hard to see all these red names down here because they are so small. But if I sort on an equal weighted basis, you can see about half of these have lost a substantial amount of money this year. Uh, here's one that uh, I've been tracking since last year, Big Bear AI Holdings. You can see based on its entire price history, this was a SPAC came to market. It's at the lower end of its trading range, having been much higher in the past. So when we talk about the mega caps and the AI theme, I think it's important to differentiate be between some of the bigger and stronger players and then some of the fringier players, which are just not seeing the love this year. And this kind of gets back to what we're seeing with the US yield curve. And I got to tie it back to the bond market because this is really what drives price action uh, a lot of times in equities. So the cyan line is the US yield curve from the short end to the long end at 2023 year end. And here's the purple line where it is today. And this is a fairly big shift higher, a uh, fairly big jump higher. It's not as dramatic as what we saw last year when we had that incredible drop. But nonetheless, uh, when we do see those rising yields, and for that matter, we have a rising dollar, that can act as headwinds on lots of stocks, especially quality stocks. And uh, that's, I think, why we're seeing this big bifurcation in the market. When we take a look at those AI heat maps, the big players really just seeing a lot of the love in the smaller ones with the weaker balance sheets, uh, not seeing quite as much. So interesting start to the week, uh, interesting start to the year, Rochelle. Uh, but there are some notable differences. Okay, we'll be watching to see where that trajectory goes. Jared Blickery, as always, thanks so much for keeping an eye on the markets for us this morning. Well, 2024 is all about the landing. That's according to our next guest. So what is the economy on track for? A soft 
or hard landing? Well, the consumer appears optimistic. University of Michigan's consumer sentiment report showing a 13 percent jump in January. Americans are feeling better about the economy, the outlook for inflation and wages. This comes despite the CPI report we got last week proving higher prices are stickier than expected. Joining us now is Paul Grunewald's S&P Global Ratings Global Chief Economist. Uh, Paul, good to talk to you this morning. We talked about the CPI data. We're expecting the PCE data next week, which is, of course, the Fed's preferred gauge. How are you looking at how quickly inflation is likely to pull back, what that ultimately means for the Fed? Right. Well, thanks for having me on the show. First, you're right. We're watching the inflation very closely and how that's going to have an impact on the, uh, the rate decision of the Fed and other central banks. We really try to split it out. There's the obvious split between the uh, core and the non-core. But even within the so-called core inflation, we're paying a lot of attention to services, and that's really pr been pretty sticky. That's a function of what you just mentioned, which is the uh, strong consumer spending, the strong labor market. Um, so if that number doesn't come down, I think that's going to lead the uh, Fed and other central banks maybe to uh, pause uh, a bit longer. But uh, we're in a data-dependent world, so we'll see how those numbers come out next week. Indeed, it is hard to sort of nail it down when you're trying to look for some consistent, consistent data here. We saw Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee saying that if inflation progress reverses, we could, that could merit hikes, something that I, I'm sure investors weren't, ho weren't hoping to see. But they also want to see more progress on housing inflation. What are going to be the key signals to watch as we go from month to month versus really taking a longer view when we're trying to look at this inflation picture? Yeah, but yeah, you're exactly right. The, the numbers have been volatile, both on the uh, real side and the financial side uh, recently. And again, the Fed's going to focus on its mandate, which is 2% um, core inflation using the uh, PCE housing as one of the clear uh, components on that. You would think that with uh, higher rates, uh, housing would slow or housing uh, price pressures would slow, but that's been kind of a mixed bag uh, as well. And then, you know, I think we want to look at the the kind of the longer view, not just the month to month, but they're looking at a clear trend. And um, the Fed's been pretty clear that they want to see a decisive downward trend in uh, inflation in the numbers that they're watching. And again, core uh, PCE inflation and core services inflation is still uh, close to 4%. So we're a long way from the target of two. And uh, again, we think that the Fed is going to be pretty uh, cautious in uh, in lowering rates unless we get a significant downturn in the economy. But with a strong labor market, strong services spending and growth, looks like it's printing again uh, above potential in the fourth quarter. That to us says that they're going to be going slower. Paul, you mentioned housing as one factor you're watching. Obviously, so much of this is also about the inventory story. It's not necessarily about the rates coming down and consumers just jumping in and seeing sort of a, a uh, a friendlier market, if you will. I mean, that sort of begs the question, how much of what we're seeing in inflation, that last mile, if you will, is in the Fed's control right now? Yeah, well, the last mile is an interesting uh, issue, right? Because to us, you have to talk about the last mile in the context of what's happening in the real economy and what's happening to demand. So again, if the labor market remains robust and consumer spending remains robust, that last mile is going to be difficult to bring inflation down to the medium term target of two. If we get a, a sharp downturn in um, employment and a sharp downturn in demand and consumer spending, then the last mile is going to be uh, less difficult. So again, our baseline uh, is the soft uh, landing with continued strength in consumer spending and labor markets. But if we go into the risk scenario with a sharper downturn, then the last mile is going to be less of an issue and you'll see central banks cut more uh, aggressively. And so, Paul, when you look at how much of the Fed's medicine has already taken hold, the IMF estimates about 75 percent of that has now reflected in the economy. Do you agree with that estimation? And what are some of the data points that you're looking at that will really give you an indication of where the economy is headed? Yeah, well, the U.S. has what we would call a slow monetary transmission mechanism. So we have a lot of fixed rates uh, in this economy, not just mortgages, but some of the commercial real estates and other things that will be maturing. Uh, over time. But, you know, this pass through of monetary policy uh, to the real economy is kind of slow in the U.S. So if you look at the U.S. For, uh, versus Europe, for example, where the ECB has been very clear that their transmission uh, works faster and their economy is slowing sooner, I think that's a real issue. And the Fed's very aware of this. They move the uh, policy rate 
and they wait to see how the uh, financial conditions respond. That's a relatively slow uh, a sort of a mechanism in the U.S. So again, I think that's another uh, piece of the puzzle that the Fed's going to take its time in uh, lowering rates. I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Paul Gronwald, S&P Global Ratings Global Chief Economist. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thanks very much for having me. So how worried should investors be about an economic slowdown and the impact on corporate earnings? Well, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, we heard top executives and economists about the state of the U.S. and global economy. Here's what they had to say. If you look at the forecast, they're pro probably a recession's more likely than a boom. And so now their basic view is we drop from the growth rate in the third quarter four plus down to 1% annualized GDP growth for the first three quarters. That is a soft landing. It didn't go negative, but it, it landed and got near zero. With higher interest rates, uh, we can feel uh, the economy uh, slowing. Um, th that doesn't mean it's going down. So as we heard there, a bit, of a, a bit of a mixed bag from these experts, everything from uh, a recession to a soft landing to perhaps just slower growth. So it just goes to show, obviously, nobody has a really clear handle on this. So if you're an investor, I mean, obviously, over the last year, everyone's been on that search for yields. So it appears to be the sort of the boring investment might be the one to make. It might be just the index funds just sort of sitting and waiting out some of this volatility. It seems to be more about preparedness than really trying to make some of these predictions here, at least if you're trying to keep some of your returns safe versus sort of panicking at every data point that comes out trying to predict a soft landing. Yeah, you know, um, uh, CEO is not necessarily handing out investment advice over at Davos, Rochelle. But w when you think about what we've been talking about on the show, this this divide that we've been seeing between where Fed officials, what Fed officials are saying, and then the market expectation, you could argue the executives we heard from over in Switzerland are, are sort of somewhere in the middle. You just heard from some of those key executives uh, Yahoo Finance spoke to this week. Jamie Dimon also saying he's a little cautious, uh, quoting him specifically, saying, he's, I think it's wrong to assume everything as hunky-dory. You heard David Solomon over at Goldman Sachs saying that this expectation of six to seven rate cuts going into this year, not necessarily something that's on his radar per se, that he thinks he has a hard time grasping that. So it's sort of interesting to hear just this idea of executives also not necessarily seeing this clear path. I mean, we've heard from um, uh, you know, the, the, the Fed officials specifically about how difficult it is to grasp where the economy is right now, just given how significant that run-up was in inflation. So, as you said, a bit of a mixed bag, but really interesting to get some color at the start of the year as we look to see where the Fed moves. No, it's true. So with that in mind, let's also take a look at some of the trending tickers that we're watching. Now, we've got our eyes on some retail stocks this morning, Williams-Sonoma, Wayfair and Macy. So starting with Williams-Sonoma dipping this morning as an SEC filing shows that President and CEO Laura Alba sold a total of 20,000 shares. Now, she's just one of a few insiders taking profit lately. Williams-Sonoma stock was up over 70 percent in the last year. And so I think it's one of these situations where investors are really passing through looking for sort of any sort of hint as to how the consumer is doing, especially for some of these big ticket items that we've really seen under pressure over the past year as consumers have become more discerning or more choiceful, we kept hearing on earnings calls. So it's interesting to see that then continuing, that nervousness continuing to percolate here, Akiko. Yeah, although, the, as you pointed out, I mean, the stock's seeing a significant bump last week, last year. Um, so maybe some profit taking happening there as well. Uh, let's talk about another company we're watching today. Wayfair joining a course of companies announcing layoffs in the last couple of weeks. The e-commerce giant is cutting more than 1,600 jobs. That's about 13 percent of its workforce. Shares jumping on the news. That stock up more than 8 percent right now. Uh, Wayfair, if you'll recall, is one of those names that saw a big bump during the pandemic. And now that you're seeing a bit of a correction, that's not necessarily a story we're seeing just in this sector, but in the tech sector as well. Wayfair uh, CEO specifically uh, saying that the company went overboard in hiring during a strong economic period and that uh, that was when online shopping spiked. And now they're having to pull back a bit. If you'll recall, just 
yesterday we were talking about Google announcing additional layoffs as well. So, you know, that comes to show you, Rochelle, despite what we're hearing about the economy and the potential soft landing, there is still a lot of adjustment that's happening coming through from uh, during the pandemic. It's true. I mean, we're still getting acclimated to it. And, and as we look at the, that memo that CEO Niraj Shah sent out on Friday, I mean, you mentioned he, they said they went overboard with hiring when it came to the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, I mean, in early 2020, they laid off about 500 workers as they saw a pullback there. Last year, 1,700 employees and, now nine, and then 900 in 2022. So it's hard to tell if this is just a an overhiring situation, being that we saw some of those job cuts already coming before the pandemic versus perhaps just a change in consumer. We've seen a lot of retailers still trying to get a grip on consumers and what they're truly interested in and what they're willing to splurge on. But unfortunately, yes, continuing to see some of these job losses. And with that in mind, Macy's also cutting jobs, planning to slash more than 3% of its employees in addition to closing five of its retail stores. Now, the company is saying it wants to redirect spending to improve the shopping experience for customers. And again, this is a post-pandemic situation. People, you know, coming back to malls, they're looking for a little bit more. If you're going to draw people out and you're not going to be, you know, giving as many bargains as we saw over the holiday season, they're going to need more impetus to come in and spend. So we, we're seeing this, at least an attempt at an improvement in the shopping experience. Unfortunately, some of these companies, as they're trying to get those get those customers back in the door, making some other cutbacks and perhaps the less profitable parts of the business. Yeah, Rochelle, you talk about a changing consumer. I mean, Macy's is one of those names pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, that's still trying to find its footing in a changing retail landscape. We think about Macy's, the, the big footprint they have in malls, but this is a company that's trying to scale back a bit. It's not just about the closures, it's about leaning on other brands they have, like Bloomingdale's, like Blue Mercury, really trying to go to where the consumer is and trying to find out what that new mix looks like. So a little more pain to come if you think about where Macy's is right now. Um, but really, that company undergoing a big transition right now, trying to reinvent the brand to become a little more relevant in this environment. It's true. Tough to find the right product mix, especially as consumers are still have so much more, more than ever to pick from, especially when you look at other e-commerce options as well. And some of these, you know, cheaper up and comers. And of course, you've got TikTok shop. People have a lot more options than they used to. So definitely going to have to do a little bit more reinventing there. All right, well, coming up, why U.S. debt may be a bigger risk for the economy than investors are thinking. We'll discuss the latest on the government's funding extension next.
With shares of iRobot, the company behind Roomba vacuum cleaners, plummeting this morning on reports that a European Union's uh, antitrust regulators reportedly planning to block Amazon's $1.4 billion buyout of the company. This marks yet another potential big tech acquisition being blocked as governments globally put up roadblocks. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan, who's digging into the story for us. And Alexis, of course, here, that's a story over in Europe, but here in the U.S., we saw that big uh, merger being blocked between JetBlue and Spirit this week. Yeah, a lot of activity in the antitrust space, Akiko. And this one-time $1.4 billion deal now reportedly, according to the Wall Street Journal, is likely to be rejected by the European Commission. Those are the regulators over in Europe that deal with antitrust. Now, Amazon's acquisition of the vacuum maker iRobot came under concern across the pond, as well as over here by the FTC, uh, concerned that it would kill competition in the robot vacuum market, if you will. Uh, the commission has yet to make a decision, a final decision here. Uh, but what the Wall Street Journal is saying is that it is likely. Now, that could really kill this deal altogether, wherever it is, whether in Europe or in the U.S. Um, but this pushback is really important kind of on a larger scale here. With putting this into context, it's really part of a multinational, multi-agency push to foreclose on these very high profile mergers and acquisitions and also anti-competitive conduct at large. Now in the US, as I mentioned earlier, the FTC has its own reported investigation into the iRobot deal, still investigating. We don't know what is going to happen with the FTC's uh, inquiry at this point. Uh, but the FTC has already filed against Amazon recently in September, bringing a suit against the company on conduct grounds saying that it's Amazon Prime business is operating in an anti-competitive way. Now, if we look beyond Amazon, though, uh, there's also a, a number of cases that are uh, big tech antitrust cases, in addition to those the airline one that you, you just mentioned. Now, you have the Department of Justice's case that's still pending uh, conclusion. It went to trial in 2023 uh, against Google, saying that the company is abusing its monopoly in the online ad market. You also have the FTC's case that didn't uh, have success for the FTC against Microsoft trying to block its acquisition last year of, my, of uh, Activision Blizzard. Uh, and also, those are just a few. There are others. You have states and the DOJ also with separate actions against Google in its search business. Uh, but guys, this iRobot deal, uh, frustrating probably for the company here. The company's been in decline for a couple of years. This putting the stock under further pressure. The company is expected to report its full year results for 2023 in February and expected to be down a roughly $7 a share on the year, guys. And so as we're looking at this, this push that we're continuing to see, obviously not just in the US, but also in Europe and other countries as well, what does this mean for the landscape for investors as they're watching, you know, regulators striking down these deals and investors really trying to make sense of why? Yeah, so going back to some of those cases that we were just showing you on the screen there, uh, there's just a push, whether it's in the European Union, uh, in the U.S., to go after whether it's antitrust alleged violations on the conduct side, saying that there's a monopoly that's operating in ways that it shouldn't, that's foreclosing on competition, or just killing these mergers, these acquisitions altogether. Uh, certainly earlier this week with the JetBlue Spirit uh, attempted merger, that one, a court deciding uh, to side with the DOJ and say that that would be problematic for customers in searching for uh, a favorable airline fares. Uh, that's a, a big one here. But, uh, you know, the Biden administration back in 2021 uh, put out an executive order saying that the DOJ, that the FTC and other regulators in the U.S. should really be thinking, rethinking antitrust in the way that the guidelines are written. There has been a draft that has gone out proposing some changes. Uh, but look, there is definitely a push here, and we're seeing, I think, uh, although there's been a decline in the number of cases filed by the DOJ and FTC since 2020, since President Trump's last year in office, we are seeing this high-profile push and the administration going after these major, major U.S. companies. We'll continue to track that. Appreciate you, as always, our very own Alexis Keenan.
Well, Congress averting a government shutdown yet again, passing a stopgap spending bill late on Thursday. Now, that marks the third funding bill of its kind since October. The latest stopgap measure extends government funding until early March, giving Congress time to finalize and agree on all aspects of the 2024 fiscal year budget. But there are growing concerns about the scale of the national debt. It reached a new high this week, topping $34 trillion. Let's get to our next guest, Doug holtz Eakin, American Action Forum president and former director of the Congressional Budget Office, to discuss more. Thank you for joining us, Doug. It seems as if we're, we, keep, we keep getting this, this can kicked down the road to the point where there seems to be almost a sense of apathy that your, your average investor or your average American isn't really as concerned about this. Why do you think that's happening and how concerned should we be about when this does officially end up hitting the economy? Well, I, I'm deeply concerned because in the 21st century, the debt has only risen, uh, even relative to the size of the economy, GDP. We've seen debt to GDP rise without any ability to get it to level off and, and uh, stabilize it. So uh, th that can continue. Um, that has deep economic implications. Uh, over the next 10 years, for example, the federal government is on schedule to borrow another $20 trillion in deficits. Um, that kind of the repeated going into the capital markets uh, is, is going to crowd out the private sector. It's going to hurt uh, investments in technologies and equipment and software and human capital, and that hurts productivity and the standard of living. And so this isn't something where kicking the can down the road avoids the problem. The problem is here already. We're paying for this in little ways every day, but there is no real attention being paid to the debt in Congress. And it's something that I really hope that the the Congress and, and the public will, will wake up to the dangers and, and begin to take it on. Uh, Doug, and you're one of those that have been on our air sort of raising that flag about the growing debt for some time now. But let's talk about the, the, what's playing out in D.C. right now, because as I see it, there is the risk of the growing debt, which is sort of a long, you know, medium to long term problem. But we're still talking about a potential government shutdown come March. Right. I mean, six right. weeks later. What what does that achieve when you consider that the House Speaker already has been getting pushback within his own party? Uh, I, I'm a skeptic about uh, exactly what's been accomplished here. Uh, the problems that were uh, evident on September 30th, 2023, or were evident uh, approaching the the February January 19th and February 2nd de deadlines. They'll be there on March 1st and March 8th. The new deadlines uh, in this short term funding bill. So. Um, I, I don't see any resolution other than some real compromise, which both sides have been unwilling to, to do thus far. So I, I don't see a lot being accomplished. This is literally just pushing the problem away for another six weeks. Um, hopefully, we can get the government funded for a fiscal year that began uh, October 1st of last year. We, and then we have to turn to the next fiscal year. So there, there's an enormous amount of work that needs to be done, and the Congress is really not accomplishing a great deal. So, Doug, are the markets right to kind of shrug this off again? I mean, that's sort of become yep. the reaction, right, which is a government shutdown. OK, maybe it'll happen. It'll probably be averted. We've got another potential deadline come March. At what point does it become something that you think investors can't ignore? Uh, I don't think a government shutdown per se is a great threat to, to markets, to the economy as a whole. Uh, we've had shutdowns. They have a... Uh, a really tiny impact on the overall growth path of the economy. Mostly it consists of shifting things around in time. You put them off and, and, and accomplish them later. And, and so you, you recover from anything you lose during the shutdown. So I don't think that's a big concern. I would say the major concern should be that if the government gets shut down, the rating agencies take this as another piece of evidence that the U.S. is unable to manage its finances and you get another you know negative watch, uh, downgrade of the credit rating, that's a big deal, and investors should care about that. Uh, the larger issue here is the capacity of our political system to manage the federal finances. And on a short-term basis, that is funding the government, it doesn't seem to be able to do that. And on a long-term basis, controlling the debt has been unable to do that. Both are really not good signs for the U.S. 
And Doug, obviously the US has gotten a bit more comfortable with, with running a deficit and having a bit of lax fiscal discipline because you have had the Chinas and the Saudi Arabias of the world, you know, buy, buying these treasuries. What would be the tipping point, though, that would let us know that, that we're, we're actually in trouble here, that the, that the US does need to wake up and come up with a longer term solution rather than these sort of stopgap measures and, and get some more fiscal discipline? Well, you know, there are two scenarios. One is the one you just described, which is world capital markets looking at the United States and saying, okay, we no longer believe that you can repay principal and interest in a timely fashion, and you're not getting any more money. And that's the sovereign debt meltdown that we have seen around the globe, Greece, Portugal, Argentina. Um, that's a long way off for the US. It, it remains a reserve currency. The, the world gives us a lot more rope, and we, and, and we use it to our, to our own detriment. Uh, so I, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I think there are other things that will trigger it first. Uh, number one, the U.S. really does have a growth crisis. Uh, you know, in the 20, 20th century, up to 2000, GDP per capita grew at about 2.4% per year. And in the 21st century, it's been 1.4% per year. That means we've foregone about $19,000 a person in income in the 21st century. We'd have 19000 more each. I would like my 19. I don't know about you. Um, but that's the the problem people have in, in seeing the reaching the American dream, the stagnation we feel. And it gets compounded by the fact that the big programs they're counting on, Social Security and Medicare notably, both have big financing problems. So we're going to get more political crisis out of poor growth and more sort of political crisis out of the, these programs uh, uh, financially failing than we're going to get out of world capital markets. I think those will come first. Those need to be dealt with. And of course, you do tend to get a lot of political grandstanding, especially in an election year. Um, but Harvard University's Ken Rogoff, he said that no matter who wins the U.S. election, that the U.S. is still going to end up borrowing more. So when people are thinking about the blame game or how they're thinking about the... <laughs> so do you agree with that? Yeah, Ken and I are, are the dismal scientists. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, here's the, here's the problem, honestly. Uh, over the next 10 years, the federal government is going to spend $80 trillion. Uh, 10 of that's going to be interest. B a big chunk of what's spending now is just paying off previous interest. 20 will be the annual decisions that Congress makes. That's what we're fighting about now in funding the government. 50 are what we think of as entitlement programs. And of that 50, 32 are Social Security and Medicare. So that's where the money is. President Biden has said he's not going to touch Social Security and Medicare. Candidate Trump has said he's not going to touch Social Security and Medicare. That's where the problem is. They're not going to touch it. So I'm with Ken. This uh, election solves none of these deep fiscal problems because the leading candidates are not willing to take them on. Something tells me, Doug, you're going to be back on our show with that warning, <laughs> raising that flag. <laughs> Always good to get your perspective. Doug holt American Action Forum President and former Director of the Congressional Budget Office. Well, coming up, AI was a key theme at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. We're going to bring you some top thoughts from business leaders on the other side. We'll be right back. You can't talk streaming wars without talking Netflix. The company that once sent you a DVD in the mail is still the industry leader. But when fourth quarter results hit on January 23rd, there are three key issues that shareholders will be watching. First up, subscriber growth, still the granddaddy of them all. That all-important metric will stand out as the true measure of success. Last time out, Netflix shocked the street by adding almost 9 million subscribers in the third quarter. That was the biggest net ad since the COVID era, when we were all stuck at home binge-watching Riverdale. It was also a sign the crackdown on password sharing was creating full-paying subscribers. Can the trend continue? Then there's pricing. In the third quarter, Netflix announced increases across some key regions. The recently phased out basic plan went from $9.99 to $11.99, and the premium plan from $19.99 to $22.99. The recession didn't happen, but can the average American still afford this along with the daily pistachio latte? Of course, you can't talk about pricing without discussing the much heralded ad-supported plan. Launched over a year ago, it now boasts 15 million monthly active users. Can momentum continue to build there? And last but not least, content. It's still king, and Netflix and its competitors are nothing without the shows and movies that keep you unsociable all year round. Spending on content creation is expected to land at around $17 billion this year. That number was skewed last year thanks to the impact of the Hollywood writer's strike. Remember that? 
The push for original material has been a big part of the strategy for co-CEOs Ted Sarandos and Greg Peters, but could increased licensing deals be the smarter play for the company? How much importance will be placed on local language unscripted series? We'll also be listening out for any mention of how gaming could be a much bigger part of the strategy going forward. Does all this set us up for a strong report? Wedbush analyst Alicia Reese thinks the company has the right formula now. Do you agree? Lots to discuss. We'll build up to the report and break it all down the moment it hits here on Yahoo Finance. AI can be used for all, you know, it can be used for cyber attacks. It can be used to design a bioterrorism weapon. You know, whenever we have new technologies, they're used to achieve positive goals uh, and, and for some challenging things as well. We have spent a lot of time creating this computing engines that you can run AI on the devices that are battery power at the edge, phone, PC, the AI PC, and cars. If I had to predict, I would say 2024 is going to be kind of the year of the AI letdown. It's going to make us recognize that it's really easy to create an AI demo, which is incredibly impressive, but it's very hard to take that demo and turn it into a product. And so I, one of the uh, things there that you have I know it, that some comments there about... coming through from. Oh, so Kika, we've been, talk we've been so, talking Rochelle, about you know, use cases AI, for, a, a for big AI. theme over at Davos. Um, you know, we've been hearing from a lot of executives throughout the week on what this all means. Uh, I can't help but think about sort of this contrast that we're seeing between, you know, the AI, the vision, the 20 year vision, if you will, of where things could go versus what we're actually seeing on the market right now. You heard the cloud flare uh, CEO right there talking about how this could be a, a year of the letdown, but these devices with AI integration are coming to the market. And I guess the big question, you know, from a market's perspective is, is how much of that is going to, to fuel interest from consumers? If you're talking specifically about handsets, PCs, which are sort of the, the first out of the gate in terms of these devices that are coming to market with AI integration. And is that experience transformative enough to, to really start this cycle? I mean, Chip makers, NVIDIA, obviously the biggest one, the biggest beneficiary so far. But, um, you know, I would argue 2024, you have the potential to see that AI rally expand even more. But it really does depend on what that experience is going to be like. 
It does. I think this is really going to be the year of, of show and prove. I mean, you've got all these sky high valuations from all these tech companies who were like, yes, we're going to, you know, work AI in. But now investors are like, okay, how? What, what are the use cases here? And we're still so early in the iterations of this. I mean, you know, Samsung is going to be including AI with its, with it, you know, with its uh, S24 phone that's coming out at the end of the month. But there's still so many unknown unknowns that we still don't necessarily know if the first movers are going to be the ones holding all the cards. And over at Davos, Arati Pravaka, who's uh, director of the U.S. White House um, Office of Science and Technology Policy, he's called this the most powerful technology of our times. But then it becomes who manages those risks? Who's going to really take the lead there on how this should be managed? Do you rely on the tech companies that touted it, but now are, are a bit more cautious as well? Or do you really let it be Congress, who perhaps isn't as experienced when it comes to these sorts of things. So it's really a sort of a, a, t- a tug and pull here, as it is still very early days. And when you think about the fact that this generative AI and most of it really kicked off just over the last year, and already look at what it's done to valuations, I think that's why perhaps a bit, a bit more caution needed at this time. Well, of course, AI is only as good as the quality of the data that it's trained on, which means tech giants like Meta and Google with a sizable edge can crush smaller players. Our next guest says billions of dollars of data was bought and sold over the last 12 months and expects it to double this year. Now, how does AI turn our data into dollars in the marketplace? Well, to tell us more, Brad Schneider, Nomad Data CEO, is here. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as Akiko was mentioning, when people think of of AI and data, it seems this sort of amorphous blob here. So what do we need to know about the sort of data that these large language models are trained on and how it actually turns into dollars for some of these companies that want to use it? Sure. I mean, one of the biggest first movers is just the media sites themselves, right? Um, A lot of these AI engines are trained on enormous corpuses of text. And so, you know, firms like Yahoo, for example, and and many of the other premier media outlets are starting to license this data to train the largest models. And that's really going to drive the first wave of this. But the second wave is going to be these more specific models, these narrower models that people are putting into the hands of consumers where they're there to perform one individual specific function. And that is going to expand the breadth of data necessary for training pretty dramatically. And so obviously there's a fire hose of data that, that's out there, even more than ever, thanks to large language models. So which companies or sectors are really leading the charge and, and really making the most of this, especially some of these larger companies that obviously have a lot more access to data? I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, obviously, the large companies, the, the Microsofts, uh, the OpenAIs, the Anthropics, they're driving sort of the beginning of this revolution. And so they are the most data hungry ones today. But really, the scale of those companies requires them to sell things to enormous numbers of people. So they're building the tools. You know, if you think about the gold rush, for example, those selling the picks and shovels were were the the largest of, of companies and the ones that sort of stood the test of time. And that's what we're seeing with these large tech companies. But really, the at least from my point of view, the innovation is going to happen with the people that are using those tools. So a lot of these companies that you have not heard of, it's going to really allow small companies to innovate and move a lot more quickly than a big company can for a variety of different reasons. Uh, you know, most of these companies selling the infrastructure, you know, a Microsoft, for example, they can't be building a product that does a million dollars a year in revenue. Their, their revenue scale is so enormous that they need to sell something to everybody. And so I think the real innovation is going to come from companies that you've heard less about, or maybe you haven't considered that, that AI could play a big role in. So, Brad, the innovation may come from some of those companies we haven't heard about yet, but the reality is every company out there is trying to figure out how to integrate this technology into their product and services. I mean, what you just suggested in terms of the amount of data that's necessary seems to suggest a widening divide between the Googles of the world and then some of the smaller companies. I mean, you're right at the center of that with the data. Well, what are you seeing as some of these smaller companies try to play catch up? So I, th- I think you're seeing a dichotomy. So on one side of the world, you've got the infrastructure companies, the, the, the people of massive scale, the Googles, the Microsofts, training these huge models, which will be used by everybody. But the, the smaller companies, they're, they're focusing on where they can differentiate, which is finding unique data to solve a much narrower problem. 
And that's something that the, the, hard co the, the larger companies are going to have a tough time going after. Um, and so you're seeing the more specific pointed applications being built by these smaller companies, whereas the large companies, they just want to be the, the, the picks and, and shovels to power this innovation. And that is a very expensive game to play. So you're not going to see that many people at the top of that pyramid. So, Brad, if you're a company and you're saying, look, I need a, the specific data because I want to launch a product or a service and I really need to know if, if this is the demographic that will spend on it and things like that. Why? What would be the option of looking at, say, using OpenAI versus investing in your own sort of proprietary LLM model in terms of the costs and being able to target your specific demographics? It's obviously easier to, to start out using a third-party service like an open AI because it means I can bring a product to market very quickly. GPT-4 is an extremely powerful model. And so I can build that into my product. I can test out, is there consumer reception for this? Do companies want to buy this product? You want to figure that out before you go ahead and spend, let's say, $50 million to build a, a, a generalized LLM. And the, the other complexity is getting that training data is, is very hard. And so I run one of the largest data marketplaces on earth, and we get people asking for very bespoke pieces of data to train models. And it's almost like a detective hunt sometimes to find it. You know, for example, let's say you want to train a legal model on, on legal documents. You need to somehow get thousands of companies real legal documents. So these, these data sets can be extremely hard to acquire. Uh, and so a lot of the competitive advantage that will be built over time is by securing the access to these streams of data. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the way the LLMs work is, is no longer rocket science. People understand how to build these things. It's the data itself which creates the differentiation. The cost of compute will continue to go down over time, but the access to the data you need to build these models, many people are trying to lock up. And that's been a strategy around data, you know, even before LLMs, is if you have access to something of value, you try to lock it up and make sure that others can't get to it. Yeah, Brad, that suggests uh, a lot of business coming your way. Uh, Brad Schneider, Nomad Data CEO, good to talk to you today. Really appreciate the time. Thanks so much. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Let's take a look at some trending tickers that we are tracking in the education technology space. Uh, take a look at those declines there. Chegg, Coursera, and Duolingo all down on the day. Coursera taking the biggest hit uh, here, coming on the back of Goldman Sachs, downgrading all three stocks to sell from neutral, citing AI as a potential headwind in the coming years for each company. Rochelle, uh, Goldman Sachs putting out a pretty hefty note here on that space today. Um, talking about a number of factors, it's not just all AI. Um, we'll take them specifically here, but um, specifically on chat um, on Chegg. I mean, well, Dan Rosenzweig, the CEO, has warned of this. He warned of it last year in the spring, talking about Chad GPT and the adoption by students weighing on growth for the company moving forward. Uh, that's flagged here in the Goldman note on Coursera specifically. Uh, Goldman lowering its price target for, to $14 from $18. He talked about weaker enterprise revenues there, not necessarily related to AI there, but um, Coursera taking a big hit today on the back of this. And then Duolingo being downgraded to sell from neutral, although a Goldman maintaining that $160 price target on the stock. It's true. I mean, and when you look at where the, the valuations already were for small and mid caps, I mean, it, it does make sense in the context here. We knew that AI was going to start, you know, taking, so, taking some of the lunch of some of these programs. Obviously, they all do different things. Duolingo when it comes to languages, but now you have AI now becoming part of people's cell phones and generative AI and some of these conversations you can have that really do take your Duolingos out of play here. And when it comes to online learning, it's really expanded. A lot of people not looking necessarily for the traditional college route either, especially when you think of student loan debt, that doesn't seem as appealing. So people are looking for some alternatives here, but still able to find some, uh, some cheaper options here. And it does mean it does make that pie a little bit smaller as you see AI chipping away and some of these other more attractive companies with better valuations also taking place. Yeah, I mean, you could argue it's still early days to see, you know, how this is really going to disrupt the ed tech space. Um, you look at somebody like Duolingo, they've integrated ChatGPT into the learning experience. Um, so they've talked about that integration before. The company has pushed it as a plus uh, for more engagement within um, that learning experience. But interesting to see how these stocks have really declined. I mean, a name like Coursera, you'll recall, they saw huge gains during the pandemic. And this is one of those other names where when people are stuck at home, they did have these huge partnerships with universities across the world to try and push for online learning. Uh, maybe a bit of a pullback coming on the back of that as well as, as this return back to classes um, affecting Coursera too. So we'll continue to watch that space. All three stocks down significantly on the day. Well, coming up, China is making a big move in the EV space. We're going to discuss on the other side of the break.
China is cutting expansion in its electric vehicle sector. Officials saying there isn't enough external consumer demand and they will take, quote, forceful measures to stop construction of EV projects. To break this down for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Inez Ferre. Hey, Inez. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah, and the vice minister of industry and information technology said Beijing is going to take forceful measures, as you just mentioned, to address blind construction of EVs, citing disorderly competition behaviors. Now, the comments come after China's EV production has basically eclipsed other countries making it a trade war focus between Beijing and Western nations. Now, last year, EU regulators launched an investigation into the Chinese EV industry amid concerns that the Chinese companies represented a threat to German, French, and Italian automakers. European car makers point to Chinese subsidies. They point to bank lending as the reason why Chinese manufactured cars have gained so much market share. Now, this follows a similar pattern when it comes to steel, when it comes to aluminum, also solar. Solar panels, industry leaders, and Western nations have said they've long complained about unfair competition stemming from cheaper Chinese products squeezing out these foreign competitors. The recent comments out of China are seen as a bit of an olive branch in the ongoing trade war and also a way to prevent price wars because when you have so much competition, this creates price wars and everyone starts slashing their prices. We've already seen some of this. However, the Chinese official also criticized the West's protectionist behaviors. Now, keep in mind, the U.S., for example, has passed legislation giving credits for EVs made in the U.S. or parts of the components of those EVs and metals extracted by U.S. or its allies for EV batteries, uh, a market which China dominates. Look, uh, BYD, the Chinese EV maker, took Tesla's crown as top EV maker in the fourth quarter, selling more battery-powered vehicles than its U.S. rivals. So Europe and other nations are saying, hey, please stop. Okay. More to come, I'm sure, on that front. And as Frey, thanks so much for that. That does it for Rochelle and I on this Friday. We've got much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.